in position, the uh, parallel vorticity is far bigger than the horizontal components. Again, to the right of the non-uniform layer, you might have the impression that you're dealing with a fast wave. So here are examples. The, para the horizontal components, and look at the numbers. They go up to 80. Here is the parallel component. Is this fine? Here is the parallel component. And uh, you should look at the numbers. It's 10 to the 4. That's one. Second observation, the vorticity, the parallel component of vorticity is completely confined to the, to the non-uniform layer. That's where the action takes place. Now, you, you can do many, you can consider many cases, but the result is always the same. It's the horizontal, it's the parallel component of vorticity that is by far the most important, but in the non-uniform layer. The horizontal components are always different from zero, but they are much smaller than the parallel component. And here is another case, same conclusion. So I've beaten you, the punker. Uh, first of all, all this discussion was in linear MHD. In linear MHD, you have an infinite number of solutions, but you pick one solution. And in linear MHD, the name tells it very clearly, you don't have nonlinear interaction. You have one wave, but the wave changes its appearance when it travels through the through the medium. So pure alphane waves and pure magnetosonic waves, they only exist if you stick to a uniform plasma of infinite extent. Otherwise, in a non-uniform plasma, the waves have both non-zero compression and non-zero horizontal and parallel vorticities. And the properties of the waves change because of the background. For a straight field, like, Chen, like Hasegawa and Oberoi told us almost, well, in 82, almost 40 years ago, it's a Eulerian perturbation of total pressure that causes the mixed properties. So for a non-uniform plasma, you have to compare parallel to horizontal vorticity. And when a wave moves from a the uniform part, there it looks like a fast magnetosonic wave into the non-uniform part. It will become something that is a mixed fast alphane. And then when it reaches, reaches the point of resonance, it will be almost an alphane wave. But you have to be careful because the total pressure perturbation is always different from zero. It has to be different from zero because that is the uh, connection to the outside world. That is the way how you get energy to the resonant position. So the, the message is believe the results for a uniform infinite plasma, but be convinced in a little bit more complicated case where your background is non-uniform, you have a more, more fun because you have mixed properties. Thank you. Thank you, Marcel. So time for some questions. Yeah, Arnold. So this uh, uh, considering a sort of a uniform magnetic field and uh, uh, deriving this alpha in fast and slow mode, that's a very interesting exercise for students. 
but in a reasonably complicated situation, uh, how useful is it? Is it can you identify uh, some modes as uh, Alvin, fast, or slow? Even if you have flux tube, you have uh, sausage and kink modes, which are somewhat different. So how useful is this analysis uh, when you are considered uh, disturbances in a completely general complicated magnetic field? Well, sausage is basically axisymmetric. Kink is m equal one is is non axisymmetric and then you just can compare how big is the parallel vorticity compared to horizontal and compared to compression and then if you really want to stick to what you know from this simple case then you say say okay here the wave looks like something that I know from the uniform case but I have to realize that this wave changes. I looked quite different 25 years ago, so I changed. And that's the same for the wave when it travels to a non-uniform plasma. Any more questions, comments? Yeah, Professor Chitri out there, ba back. Well, a very elegant summary of uh, alpha waves magnetosonic waves, along with vorticity, which you kept on highlighting. Would you care to comment on the role of magneto-vorticity if you combine both the effects? Will it have any role in your analysis? On the what? Magneto-vorticity. Basically, I combine the vorticity vector omega with uh, gyro frequency, and you can derive an equation similar to what we do for, you know, magnetosonic waves. You mean so the equation not for vorticity, wow. the equation that I use for vorticity um, agrees with the general equation mm -hmm. for vorticity in a magnetic plasma. Right. So but the the calculations that have been do, done by Sheila, what is his name? He is now in Australia. Uh, Party? Well, uh, anyway. Mm -hmm. So I've checked that. Oh, Shaila, I checked, okay. Yeah. who was in uh, Sheffield. Yeah. yeah. I've checked that. Uh, they, they agree. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was more curious uh, in what way will the analysis be modified if you consider magneto-vorticity, combination of vorticity and um, gyro frequency, which happens in plasma physics. Anyway, that's a separate issue. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Okay, let's, oh, yeah. The last question, yeah. Um, are there some general approaches to dealing with cases when the adiabatic constants are no longer constant? The, the Chandrasekhar adiabatic exponents are no longer constant? Like you mean the gamma? Yeah, uh, well, the, the, the gamma, the yeah, gammas. Yeah. CP over CV. Yeah, so, so. Uh, do, do, is there a general theory of how to deal with this? I don't think anything will change, but I don't know. I, I can't prove that by, by equations. So I'm reluctant to make a definite statement, but I, I guess it doesn't matter much. Uh, because compression and vorticity will not crucially depend on the gamma. So I don't think it will, will uh, change a lot. But uh, I'm in a mathematics department. I can only make strong statements if I see it from equations. So anyway. OK, let's uh, thank Marcel for this uh, nice overview. So we'll move to the next uh, talk by Aishwarya. I will give you warning after 10 minutes. She'll be talking about amplitude modulations of waves in fan loops.
good morning, everyone. I am Ashwanya Sharma, a final year PhD student working with uh, Durgesh Atayuka. So here today I am going to present on our recent work on amplitude modulation of MHD waves observed in fan loops that has been carried out in collaboration with Durgesh, Robertus Erdely from University of Sheffield, Girijesh Gupta from USOPRL, and Gaji Amin Ahmed from Tejpur University. So before going into the details of our work, a brief introduction to fan loops and waves observed along fan loops. So fan loops are one of the most stable and longest living loop structures observed at the age of active regions. They have a temperature uh, around 0.6 to 1 million Kelvin. And it has been found that most, they are mostly rooted at the umbra or umbra penumbra boundary of sunspots. Now, one of the wave modes observed along these fan loops are slow magnetoacoustic waves. Already Marshall has given a very good introduction on the different wave modes observed in the solar atmosphere. So these magnetoacoustic waves uh, observed along these fan loops, they are compressional in nature, means they show intensity variation uh, in, in, uh, in its response to density variations. So and they propagate along those field lines and they have a, a phase speed which is less than the speed of uh, sound, speed, uh, speed of local, local speed of sound in the corona. So the first observations of uh, intensity oscillations along fan loops were done by Bergsman and Cleese in 1999 uh, by using EIT and 195 angstrom channels. So it has been found that uh, uh, the slow magnetoacoustic waves observed along fan loops, they are mostly dominant around three minutes. Although a very few studies have reported longer period waves like 8, 12, 16 minutes along these fan loops, although the excitation mechanisms behind such longer period waves are not discussed or reported much. So uh, in this, uh, in our study, uh, in this work, we have done a detailed study to understand the spatiotemporal evolution uh, of uh, intensity waves propagating along uh, fan loops uh, that is anchored in a sunspot regions. The, the study has been carried out by Atmospheric Imaging Assembly on board Solar Dynamic Observatory, and this is our analyzed active regions. As we can, here we show the active regions in different AIA channels. This different AIA channels corresponds to different temperatures and hence different layers of the solar atmosphere. So as we can see, the active region consists of a sunspot, a positive polarity sunspot. And as we look at the active regions in AIA extreme UV channels, we can see fan loops emanating from the umbra as well as umbra penumbra boundary. So now our motive is to study the uh, uh, propagation of waves along these fan loops. To do that, we employ time distance analysis techniques. So uh, this technique is based on drawing artificial slits along fan loops. So we have uh, sojourned three fan loops. These three fan loops we have sojourned and drawn three artificial slits along them. The fan loops are sojourned on the basis of AIA 171 angstrom as, the, as we know that the fan loops are best seen in AIA 171 angstrom. So the whole study has been carried out for all these three fan loops as well as for the three uh, for the three fan loops as well as for all the three AI extreme UV channels. Uh, but for brevity, I'm explaining my results for slit one and AIA 171 angstrom. Okay, so this is how the results of time distance analysis looks appears. So this is called the time distance map. So X axis we have time and Y axis is the length of the slit in arc second. So what we see uh, in 171 angstrom, there is clear propagations of uh, intensity, this intensity oscillations we can see, so in the form of this bright and dark ridges. So we have measured uh, the projected phase speeds of these intensity oscillations by drawing slope as well as by doing cross correlation analysis. And we have found that the average speed is around 50 km per second, which is less than the speed of sound for 1 million Kelvin corona, which is around 140 km per second. So it says that these oscillations are slow magnetoacoustics in nature. So we have seen clear propagation of such intensity disturbances in all the AIA extreme UV channels except AIA 94 and 335 as they are very hot channels and fan loops cannot be seen in those hot channels. 
So now apart from this usual propagation of this uh, intensity oscillations, if we notice we see that there is a peculiar pattern. This, uh, this intensity is increasing and decreasing. There is an increase and decrease of increase and decrease of this patterns. So to study it in detail, we extract light curves from this few locations L1, L2, L3, L4 and we see that these are the light curves. So these are for few locations L1, L2, L3. In the left panels, they are the original light curves and once we subtract the background, we get the detrended light curves. And in the detrended light curves, it becomes very clear, we see that the amplitude of the oscillation, there is an increase and decrease of this pattern. So implying in that modulation is going on. So to now to characterize these modulations uh, further or to understand the origin of such modulations, we perform Fourier as well as wavelet analysis. Now we, this is the Fourier analysis results for one location, this location for L1 location and uh, in AIA 171 Ekstrom. So what we see first uh, between, yes, uh, uh, 5 to 6 millihertz, which is around 3 minutes, there are three strong peaks along with many small, small peaks. So F2, F1, F2, F3, F4, they are very, they are the strong peaks and this, there are many nearby small peaks. So now observations of many uh, nearby peaks suggest a possibility that uh, the phenomenon like beat is happening in the solar atmosphere. So beat is a phenomenon when two nearby frequencies, say F dash and double dash, F double dash overlap giving rise to a bit frequency f dash minus f double dash. So now if we consider that the bit is happening and if we look at the combinations of this three, all frequency components, what we find, say I am considering f2, f3, f4 which are the dominant frequencies, the combination of these frequencies gives us bit periods around 29 minutes, 55 and 62 minutes. And while if we can consider combination of these strong peaks with all these smaller peaks, we find uh, bit periods around 30 minutes, 13 and 8 minutes. So, and I would like to say in this case, like if we do a simple visual inspection on these light curves, we see that this pattern, they have a modulation period around in 20 to 30 minutes, which is, which agrees with our, these things, 29 period, whatever we have got. Again, but the question comes like in the solar atmosphere, which is very dynamic and complex, it is difficult to explain anything uh, with respect to an ideal like one bit frequency because whatever we are finding it's an amalgamation of all the frequencies. So next uh, we do wavelet analysis. See Fourier uh, analysis it gives it shows only the frequency components present in the waves. Wavelet gives the variation of frequencies over time. So this is our wavelet results. The top panel shows the detrended light curves, means background subtracted light curves. The left, this panel shows the, the wavelet analysis, the wavelet panel. This is time, this is period, and this is what we call the global wavelet. This is the wavelet power average over time, which is three hours, four hours in our case. So what we see first, we see that most of the powers of these waves are uh, included, in, uh, are within two to four minutes, with three minutes as the dominant oscillations. And we can see the modulation very clearly here. There we can see this, this, there is an increase and decrease of this three minute oscillations power, which is almost simultaneous to this observed um, means intensity evolutions. So now to quantify the modulation period, we uh, approach one, uh, we uh, approach one technique. So we see that most of the oscillations are peaked in three minutes and Fourier shows many strong peaks within two to four minutes. So inspecting that most of the powers uh, are coming from the, uh, from the oscillations within two to four minutes, we have uh, created wavelet power which is average over this two to four minutes. And now we believe and this power, wavelet power, average between two to four minutes will essentially mimic an amplitude modulations, uh, sorry, an amplitude variation that will be given by all the waves between two to four minutes. Now we do wavelet on this and that's what we find. If we do wavelet on this, we find periods like this, like to, uh, from uh, above 20 minutes. 
So here the we are showing our results for one location L1 for 171 angstrom. As we do it for all the location and all for all the extreme UV channels, we found that the mean modulation period lies in between 20 to 30 minutes. Yeah. So this is uh, the gist of our work uh, in in very short. So first we have done a very detailed study of. Uh, uh, propagating waves observed along fan loops. We can see clear propagation of this intensity oscillations. Above all, we have seen a distinct pattern. We have seen a distinct amplitude modulation. The modulation is best seen for 171 angstrom, though other AI extreme UV channels, they also show. Uh, uh, Fourier power spectrum shows a lot of uh, mini peaks around three minutes and which supports the possibility of occurrence of bit-like phenomenon in the solar atmosphere. And we have done wavelet analysis also. There also see that the oscillations are picked around 33 minutes. And the, the three minutes oscillations are, incre are increasing and decreasing over time, indicating the modulations. And the mean modulation period is observed in the, to be in the range of 20 to 30 minutes. And to our knowledge, this is the first observational study to detect such amplitude mo or, uh, modulation, means mainly in the original light curves, although the, the study has been carried out for the trended light curves. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Ashina, for keeping well within time. So time for questions. Uh, first, Marcel, then Julio. Yeah. Nice talk. Thank you. Um, these two, F1 and F2. Yes. Where do they come from? Because if you go back to your first uh, diagram, that one. Yes. Apparently, most power is not in the F1. Uh, apparently, most power not F1, F2, F3, F4. Yeah, but not in F1. Not in F1. So we are but looking. Not in F2. Means F3, F2, F3, F3. These are the means strong means one of our strong peaks. So wouldn't you expect beats from F3 and F4? Yes, means uh, if we do some computation, if we uh, um, uh, yes, if we consider F3 and F4. We are getting in period of uh, about 62 minutes. And if you are considering, like, I, I, I don't know, like all these three combinations, it, uh, the F2, F3, F4, we are considering different combinations. And it is giving bit periods around 29, 55, and 62 minutes. And 29 minutes is close to whatever visual inspection of the original light, of the light curves gives. So. Yeah, Julia? Isn't this modulation associated or the same thing, basically, to the modulation that we saw yesterday on the sunspot oscillations, which are, were observed in, normally observed in the visible? So if you remember the talk yesterday, yes, you, see, yes. you see these about three minutes, but yes. they also come in these packets. In, in these packets. Yes. So basically, is, aren't these the same thing, basically, just propagating through the atmosphere? Or have you looked at that? Because that would be interesting. Yes. We are, yes, I noticed like yesterday the talk that was for sunspot umbra in the lower in the chromosphere they did it. But in the chromosphere, even I have found like if I like to do such study with 304, the bit like patterns are very clear. But this is something we are finding along the fan loops at different locations. That's how it's different. But in yes, chromospheric sunspot umbra, we have noticed it before, yeah. Okay, so I have few comments. Yes. First of all, I think your statement that you know, but there are actually several reports of this kind of uh, behavior, particularly Valery Nakaryakov and his group. Okay. Even in the stellar context, you find similar behavior of okay. multiple things. So one also uh, thing would be to use EMD or some kind of uh, this kind of analysis, which will allow you to identify these uh, different uh, modes uh, more okay. clearly. Okay. Yeah, and there is a lot of statistical work also in terms of fan loop which is connected with sunspots mm -hmm. and which is not connected with sunspots to see about their drivers. So yes. please go through those uh, articles also. Sure, so there are sure. good, good, sure. uh, you Thank know, you, yeah. uh, good possibilities. Yeah, yeah. So there's good possibilities to look at all that. Okay. So oh, uh, last comment or question from Chia. So in the beginning, you actually have the data for different uh, frequencies, different wavelengths. So did you, do you have the data, like the power spectrum or wavelength spectrum for different wavelengths? Like you only show the 171. Do okay. you have higher temperature or lower temperature yes, results? Yes, yeah. I actually, I didn't, probably I didn't, I 
Yeah. yeah, may I yeah, request you to uh, look at those? I'm, no, I'm sure no, no. she will have those. So right uh, now, plots just as I well. have for 304 only. I for not for all the extreme UV channels, but yes, here we can see for 304. Okay, so let's uh, thank Ashwinder and move to the next talk. So this is a special talk also. This is a, a you know, runner-up of, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, it's a special talk for the Young Career Award, so close runner-up. Uh, and I would request uh, Shibata-san to come on stage and say a few words about uh, the speaker. And also, uh, probably from the organizer, I would request somebody to do the honors. Can I ask the volunteers to come on stage, please? Yeah. So as I mentioned, this is a special uh, talk of 45 minutes, uh, Shimozu Shan. After the short ceremony, uh, <laughs> I will start my timer. So I will give you a warning after uh, 35 minutes for five minutes. So I request uh, Shibata san to say a few words, please. Yeah, uh, as you know, uh, I'm a theoretician. But nevertheless, Shimojo-san became my student and uh, has made a very nice observational analysis. So uh, uh, I'm very much impressed uh, more than 20 uh, years ago. <laughs> and uh, uh, I'm very happy uh, to uh, uh, now here, uh, he will uh, give a runner-up talk. Okay. <laughs> anyway, congratulations. <laughs> no, you can give it for the moment. <laughs> if you like, you can. Oh, okay, 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 no problem. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Pictures will be nice. Okay. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. So, good morning, everyone. My name is Massimi Shimojo. I would like to talk about the solar uh, study of the solar X-ray jet uh, based on the multi-wave language observations. So, before the, my lecture, I want to thank to all my great collaborator on the selection committee of the APSPM Young Career Award. I'm very hon honored to the receive the, uh, this award. Uh, but the uh, helps and the uh, collaboration uh, contribution by my friends and uh, my family are uh, essential to my achievements. So I greatly uh, appreciate the support of uh, my uh, great collaborator and my family. At first, I deeply thank Professor Shibata, uh, Shibata Sensei. Uh, she, uh, he was uh, my supervisor from the fourth grade uh, undergraduate student, student until the PhD course. So I learned the uh, fundamentals of the research from him. I also thank Professor Watanabe and Professor Kosugi. Uh, Watanabe Sensei was uh, also my supervisor at the PhD course, and uh, Kosugi Sensei was uh, my supervisor when I was a postdoctor fellow at ISAS. And uh, Professor Nakajima, Professor Hills, Dr. Bastian, Dr. White, and uh, Dr. Iwai, uh, they are my mentor, uh, mentors about the radio telescopes. I studied uh, my career from the uh, analysis of the solar data, solar X-ray data. Hence, I was not familiar uh, to radio telescope, uh, especially hardware issues. So I asked many things to this, uh, these mentors. So Iwai-san is younger than me, but he is a specialist of the radio telescopes. 
Uh, so uh, I asked him many things. So I greatly appreciate his help, but uh, he might be hate me because uh, I ask many, many things. <laughs> so I also uh, thank all members of uh, Yoko and Obeyama Sora, uh, Hinode, and uh, uh, Alma Project. And uh, finally, I greatly uh, thank my family. Uh, they give me the power every time. So uh, let's go to the, my lectures. So today, I would like to talk about uh, the following things. At first, I so at first I talk about the, my very early phase of the, my science career as an introduction, and the next I talk about the basic properties of the solar X-ray jet based on the uh, result uh, achievement as my PhD program. A solar X-ray jet is uh, one of the, my main topics for my research. So after the introduction of the basic property, I will discuss how to accelerate a uh, hot plasma in a solar X-ray jet. So. Uh, uh, and I want to mention about the mission portion to the understanding the acceleration of the flow. Uh, finally, I will talk about the particular acceleration study in the next solar maximum with the solar observation with ARMA. So let's move to the first part. First part is my old story. So 13 August 1991, it was a day of the starting of the new era of the solar physics. So on this day, Yoko satellite was launched. At the time, I was a second grade undergraduate student uh, of the Department of Physics, Tōka University. It is a private university located near the Tokyo, and uh, I did not know this news at this time. So in my university, a meeting is uh, held in the every winter for introducing the research of the professors to third graduate, third grade university, uh, undergraduate, undergraduate students. So because a student selects a lab and uh, do the uh, research for uh, writing a graduate thesis since uh, next April. So she is, uh, she is uh, uh, Dr. Shizuyo, uh, Shizuyo Hashimoto, the professor of the Tokai University. She attends a meeting and uh, introduce her topics. Her subject is a spectroscopy of the experimental plasma, uh, especially radicals in plasma. So when I was a third grad, grade uh, undergraduate student, I frequently visited the lab of the plasma experiment, experimental group and uh, help, her, help their uh, experiment, experiment. So hence, her lab was uh, one of uh, my candidates. After the introducing her research, uh, she said, I can arrange the, for you to study astronomy in NOJ. If you desire it, please ask me. So then she finished her talk. So Professor Hashim, uh, Hashimoto was a classmate of the professor, professor Hirayama, who was the di director of the solar physics division of the NMOJ at this time. So Hirayama-sensei had requested her to encourage uh, students of the Ha University to join Yoko satellite team because the human resource for the investigated Yoko data was shortage. So I was very surprised in her uh, last word. I was very interested in the astronomy, but I gave up the research of the astronomy in the university because there is no professor of the astronomy in my department. But the way to the astronomy was open to me that time. So in the next week, I visited her office and requested an arrangement to study in the NAOJ. So 26 April 1993, I was a fourth uh, grade undergraduate student the day is my visiting, uh, my first visiting of NAOJ. So I remember well this day. So Professor Hirayama assigned Professor Shibata as my supervisor and introduced me, Shibata Sensei. Uh, at that time, Hirayama Sensei said to me, you have to say only magnetic reconnection at the front of the Professor Shibata. If you keep it, you would be peaceful. <laughs> so in the university, I, I took the class of the plasma physics but I do not know a magnetic reconnection because uh, class do, uh, the class does not include the MHD theory. So hence, uh, I, in the, at that time, my I what is the magnetic field is cut and reconnected. So finally, oh my God, I come to the table <laughs> hard place. So I saw the such thing at the end of the, this visit. But now I can understand that this world, his world. So this time, is the EVO of the unified model, CSHKP model of the solar flares proposed by Shibata, well, uh, Shibata Sensei, so as you know well. So he was making great efforts to this, establish this, uh, this model. So anyway, through the, these circumstances, I started the research for the graduate, uh, graduate university. 
At that time, I consider that uh, I would have, uh, from, uh, I, I would leave from the research after the finish the master course. So in next month, uh, in next month, May 1993, I visited Shibata Sensei's office to discuss my study for graduate at the university. He said, "So read Shibata Eta to 1992 and uh, look for." Uh, uh, look, uh, Look for the X-ray jet from the full sign image taken with a soft X-ray telescope about the Yoko. Solar X-ray jet uh, is a, a phenomenon discovered from a Yoko data, and he already published the paper to uh, report the this discovery. But the paper is a report of the, a few events, so we w wanted to know the general pro property of the solar X-ray jet. And uh, in this era, the capacity of the computer is uh, very poor. So there is no MP, MP4 movies and uh, YouTube. So it is very difficult to see the, such a movie, such a movie on the PC. So to reduce the difficulty, there was a writable laser disc uh, system at the Sangamihara campus of the ISAS. So Lockheed Martin people who are the collaborator of the Yoko project created the SXT Fulsan movie for quick look on the, this laser disc system. So the, this system was a very important to start start a new study for the Yoko data at the time. After visiting Shibata Sensei's uh, office, he took me to ISAS. Since this day, I want to ISAS every day, uh, sit down at the front of the laser disc system, uh, watching the SXT Fulsa movie, and uh, look for the uh, solar X-ray jet. So this is a uh, uh, one page of the, my research note in the summer of the 1993. So after the sitting in the front of the laser discs, System, I, at first, I, uh, uh, I drew the circle using a compass like this. And uh, uh, see the SXT movie and drew the coronal structure and the jet every day. So I continued this work for three months. Three months later, I made a list of the solar X-ray jet based on the, this notes and I showed it to the Shibata Sensei. So he said, so, okay, good. So prepare the talk in the whole meeting of the Astronomical Society of the Japan. The full meeting of the Astronomical Society of Japan is usually held in the September. So there is only one month by the meeting. But I said to the front of the Shibata Sensei, okay boss, I will start the preparation soon. But in my head, I have to give a talk at a meeting with society, science society. I was a, I am a stupid undergraduate student and I spent only three months for research. So what does he, he say? Is he crazy? <laughs> of course. I never said such a thing of, at the front of the Shibata Sensei, only in the, my head. <laughs> As a result, so uh, the final summer's vacation of the, my university era was gone. But it's a very good opportunity for me. So I, I was uh, entered the deep swamp. That's a core name, it's a so, solar physics winning ring. So the survey of the solar X-ray jets continued six months, finally. I found about 150 candidates of the jets. I measured the length, apparent velocity, and the lifetime of the 150 events, and, and classified them morphologically. In February 1994, I finished writing thesis in Japanese for graduating the university. The thesis is accepted by the evaluation committee, and I graduated the university in March 1994 and the end of the master course. In 1996, we published, published this uh, paper. The paper is an English version of the, my graduate thesis with uh, minor modifications. So this paper is the most cited paper in my paper current now. So my most cited paper is my thesis for graduating university, not master thesis, not PhD thesis. <laughs> So it is not good for me, so I want to overcome this paper. So it is one of my minor motivation for researching solar physics. <laughs> yeah. So from this paper, so we entered the science issues. So at first, I introduced the general property of the solar X-ray jet. So based on the Shimojo Eta 1996. Uh, solar X-ray jet is a jet phenomenon observed with the soft X-ray telescopes. So it is always, uh, always associated with a small flare or big flare. So a big flare means uh, larger than C-class, goes C-class flare. 
So uh, such a super, uh, larger flare uh, produces a jet phenomena, but most cases show more complex and eruptive stru structure, like a uh, uh, plasmoid or something, uh, as you know. So in most jets, the width of the jet is a uh, constant or decreasing the, with the dis distance from the foot point flare. And uh, the most interesting morphological feature is a gap between the center of the flare and the root of the flare, uh, root of the jet. So the jet, uh, the root of the jet does not connect to the brightest part of a flare. The gap is very interesting from the theoretical point of view. So, so uh, when I was a graduate student, uh, Dr. Yokoyama's office is located across from the corridor of the Shibata Sensei's office and uh, investigated the magnetic reconnection using MHD numerical simulation. The left panel shows uh, the one of the famous results by uh, Yokoyama and Shibata. The simulation shows a magnetic reconnection between the emerging cracks here and uh, uh, oblique coronal magnetic field, this one. This is a temperature map, and uh, this is a density map. So uh, the <coughs> they succeed in the, uh, producing a small flares, a small flare here, and a cool jet and a photojet simultaneously. So it is a model of the solar X-ray jet based on the magnetic reconnections. The interesting point from the simulation is there is a gap between the root of the, uh, root of the jet and the flare. So it is in the uh, observation, the light panel is the most impressive uh, solar X-ray jet. We can see the flare on the side, flare side is here, and the jet is here. So there is a gap between the uh, flare and the jet. So this may show very similar property showing the simulations. The model of the solar X-ray jet also predicts the magnetic environment of the jet producing regions should be mixed. Uh, so jet producing region should be mixed priority and there are the emerging flux. So I try to verify the predict, uh, prediction using a kit peak magnet gram. So this, result, uh, this is a result is a, a Shimocho Shibata and Karen Harvey 1998. The research shows that the most solar X-ray jet occurred above the mixed priority uh, uh, mixed polarity region, especially above the satellite sunspot. So and it is very rare that uh, jet occurred above the single polarity regions. So we also investigated the time evolution, time evolution of the flux uh, at the jet producing region and found that x jet associated with not only emerging flux, uh, but also cancelling fluxes. However, the difference in the emerging and the cancelling flux is not a serious issue. Because the cancelling flux rate are larger than the emerging flux rate, we observed only cancelling flux, even when there is an emerging flux system. On the other hand, when the exit loop system approaches open magnetic field by the convection motion, its magnetic configuration is very similar to that, uh, that constructed from the emerging flux and the oblique magnetic field. So emerging while cancelling is not a big issue, except when we consider the energetics. So next, I started the investigation on the acceleration of hot plasma. To study the, this topic, not only the velocity, but also temperature and density are very important. The time cadence of the soft X-ray telescope full, full disk image is not enough for the, this topic. Hence, I looked for the solar X-ray jet from the partial frame image of Yoko SXT again, and found about 60 jets uh, that occurred before the breaking the periphery of the SXT. The summary of the data and I, uh, shown in this page. The temperature range of the uh, soft, uh, soft X-ray jet is uh, 3 to the 8 megakelvin, and the uh, jet temperature is similar to that of the flares. This plot shows the uh, uh, horizontal axis indicates the flare temperature, and the vertical, temperature, uh, vertical axis is the uh, temperature of the jet. So I'm sorry, it is very faint. And the, this uh, dashed line indicates the uh, jet temperature equal to the flare temperature. So from this uh, plot, so, so this uh, foot, uh, flare uh, temperature is very similar to the jet temperature. And uh, the density of the jet around the 10 to the 9th per cubic centimeter. And uh, from, this jet, uh, from this result, we can estimate the thermal energy of the jet. It is uh, from the 10 to the 27th to the 10 to the 29th L. And the jet energy, jet thermal energy is uh, 10 times smaller than the foot point flares. So we already know the temperature. 
So we can estimate the sound speed in the jet. So, and I compare this. So this is a result of compare is a horizontal axis indicates the uh, velocity of the jet and the vertical axis is a, a temperature jet. And this dotted dashed line indicates sound speed. So in most of layer, uh, this dash, uh, vertical uh, line indicates the uh, uh, event. So most event indicated the, uh, most event, uh, the velocity is slower than sound speed. But even the lower velocity is faster than 100 km per second. So compare the result of the observation and the simulation, the following questions were rising in the 1990s. Why the MHE simulation cannot, cannot reproduce hot and dense jets? The hot jet reproducing in the simulation is a low density jet. Low density means that the density is similar to the density in the oblique coronal magnetic field before the reconnection. So the actual number is about 10 to the 7th or 10 to the 8th per cubic centimeter. It is significantly lower than the observation result because the heating conduction was not included in the simulation at this era. So chromospheric evaporation does not occur in the simulation. So to solve this question, we need to find the evidence that the hot jet seen in the SXT image is an evaporation flow. So second one is that in the MHE simulation, the velocity of the jet is around the alpha speed in corona about 1,000 km per second. On the other hand, the observed uh, velocity is lower than the sound speed. The average is about 200 km per second. So we cannot see the magnetic driven jet in Yoko so SXT image. So in my PhD research, I concentrated to, concentrated to, to the solve the first questions. So to solve this puzzle, I assume the following, mo following model based on the magnetic reconnection and the evaporation, uh, atmospheric evaporation. So mighty reconnection occurs between the emerging flux and the oblique magnetic field at this site. The reconnection outflow uh, from the reconnection site like this, this blue, uh, blue arrow indicated. So uh, the <coughs> roughly speaking, the reconnection outflow is a hot jet in the simulation. The from the reconnection site, heat flux also flowing along the magnetic field like this. Then the energy bombard the chromosphere and occurred chromosphere evaporation, chromospheric evaporation. In the closed loop site, uh, the bright and the dense flare loop appeared, and in the open field site, the evaporation flow appeared as a hot and dense jet. Based on the, this model, we try to the predict the temperature and the mass of the jet. So if you want to know the detail of the prediction, uh, please read the Shiba, Shimojo and the Shibata 2000. In this talk, I skip detail and uh, describe the only concept. To estimate the jet, uh, to estimate the jet temperature, we assume the energy flux generated by the magnetic reconnection balances with the heat conduction. The energy flux was estimated from the thermal energy, rising time, and the size of the uh, foot point flare. The result of the, this estimation is shown in this plot. So horizontal axis is a prediction, and the vertical axis is the observation. observation. So this is line indicates the uh, observation equal to the uh, prediction. So we can see that <coughs> the prediction value is uh, very similar to the observation one, observed one. So next is a prediction of the jet mass, uh, jet, jet mass based on the chromosphere evaporation. So we assume the radiation loss is neglected and the heat conduction, heat conduction, uh, heat conduct, uh, heat flux by the conduction uh, balances with the entropy, entropy flux caused by the an evaporation flow. So finally, the mass of the jet is uh, predicted this formula. This formula. The compar comparison of the observa observed mass with the result, uh, with the result of the estimation is seen shown in the, this uh, plot. So horizontal axis is the prediction and the vertical axis is the observed one. So dash one indicates the uh, uh, observed equal to the prediction, so we can see that uh, prediction uh, value is very similar to the observed one. So from this plot, we can say the estimate, estimation, uh, the estimation indicates the actual the observed mass. So I also perform the hydro, one dimensional hydrodynamic simulation, including the heat conduction, and I verify the, these estimations. From the study, we conclude that solar X-ray jets occurred in the active region is evaporation flows. So in my PhD courses, I obtained various observations 
and the theoretical result about uh, observational and the theoretical result about the solar X-ray jet. The first one, based on the statistical study, we reveal the general property of the X-ray jet. And uh, we confirm that the magnetic configuration of the jet producing region is similar to the predict from the uh, model. And uh, this study is not direct to the connect, connect to the study of the X-ray jet, but uh, we reveal that the occurrence rate of the small flare, even in a small bipole, shows the power of distributions. And uh, I found the observational, result, uh, ob observational evidence that the X-ray jet near the sunspot are constructed from the evaporation flow. And uh, in next year, using hydrodynamic simulation, we succeed in reproducing the observing, observed X-ray flux and uh, its time evolution based on the chromospheric evaporations. Summary my result in PhD courses is I solved the first question, why observed jets are denser than, than in the simulation? So we confirm that the solar X-ray jet in the active region is evaporation flow. But second question was still a puzzle in the 2000, uh, uh, early 2000s. So in, in March 1999, I got a PhD degree and studied the postdoctoral post fellow life uh, supervised by uh, Kosugi Sensei. In 2000, I was employed by uh, Nobuyama Solar Radio Observatory as an assistant, uh, while I contributed to, the, con contribute to the operation of the Nobuyama Radio Heliograph and the Nobuyama Radio Parameters, uh, I joined the Hinode Satellite Project. So this page shows my main contribution to the Hinode Project. In the early phase of the de development, I con con contribute to the design and the verification of the X-ray analysis filter of the X-ray telescope about the Hinode. I also took the responsibility of the contact person of the scientist side for the attitude control system of Hinode. I joined the, its development team, development team, and uh, architected the interface between the uh, attitude control system and the scientist. So based on the, this knowledge, I led the mission operation and the data analysis group of Hinode and uh, documented the scheme of the Hinode scientific uh, operations. Hinode satellite has been operated based on the, this document until now. I also continued, uh, contributed to uh, the establish and the operation of the Hinode Science Center at NAOJ. So all computer several uh, seen in the, this uh, photo uh, was donated by the, some microsystems. So for this donation, I evaluated the PC cluster system for solar data analysis and I write, uh, wrote a data detailed uh, report one year before the launching a Hinode satellite. After the uh, launch Hinode, I contributed the education, education and the public outreach activity of the Hinode. I and the Power Hinode group made the DVD for introducing the initial result of the Hinode general public. So this DVD uh, will be uh, introduced by the Yaji-san in, on, uh, in this uh, meeting on Friday. So uh, the back to the science one. Uh, thanks to the high special resolution, high time cases, and the high sensitivity for lower temperature of the XRT, XRT of, about the Hinode, we found numerous small jets in polar coral hole. So it is uh, like the forest of the jet. Saturn et al. 2007 and uh, Subject et al. 2007 reported the uh, solar jet, uh, the occurrence rate of the polar jet is uh, 60 events per day. So this value was strange for me because we can find only a few jets in polar, jet, polar region. Even when we consider the lower time cadence of the Yoko SXT, it could not be understand this uh, result. So however, I consented to the study of the producing mechanism of the jet in early phase of the Hinode era. So from XRT data, I found the fine structure in the jet. So expanding, so expanding loop and the plasmoid, and the zebra pattern was in, in the jet. So in the uh, different, uh, learning difference image. So this zebra pattern does not indicate the wave because the phase velocity is too slow comparing the alpha, alpha wave and the sound wave. It might be indicated the progress, uh, progress of the magnetic reconnection. So I also analyzed the full stocks uh, primate data, uh, the, uh, full stocks data uh, taken by Hinode SOTSP. So the, and we, uh, we confirm that the polar jet produced by the same mechanism as uh, that in the active regions and uh, reveal that many emerging flux exist even in the polar region. The eruptive structure in the jet were investigated with the STO data by Mu et al, and they proposed a blowout model for the solar X-ray, as you know well. So in 2008, I got a new student from the Tokyo University, then 
I decided to imitate my supervisor, Shibata Sensei. So I said to the student, read Shimozo Eta 2007 and look for the X ray jet from the XRT images. So he's a Dr. Uh, Sako. When I was, a prep so when I was a prepar when I was preparing this talk, I deeply looked for the, his photo in my hard disk, but I cannot find it except this one. <laughs> <laughs> so this uh, photo taken at a Japanese style bar. So after coming back to the Japan, I will apologize to him for this point. <laughs> so anyway, I requested, I requested the JET uh, survey for XRT data to him. At that time, so we can easily see the, such a movie uh, on the PC, and uh, he looked for the solar X-ray jet like this uh, movie, from like this movie. <clears throat> so he found over the thousand candidates of the jet from XRT images. So based on the, this survey, he wrote a paper that uh, described the relationship between the jet's brightness and the coronal hole boundary. So this page shows the main, main list of his paper. The light panel shows up, <coughs> light panel shows up uh, time variation of the uh, occurrence rate of the jet and the brightenings. So in jet's case, the occurrence rate in the coronal hole boundary is the highest one. Second is the coronal hole, and the third is the polar quiet region. The occurrence rate of the jet in the polar quiet region is similar to that in the equatorial, equatorial quiet regions. In the bright, brightening case, the very small, uh, small flare case, the occurrence rate is a coronal hole, coronal hole boundary is the highest one. That is the same as the jet case. But the second one is the polar quiet regions. And it is also similar to the equatorial quiet regions. And the lowest one is a coronal hole. The difference of the order might be caused by the existence of the open field, because the open field is essential for the creating jet structure. So in this paper, the other property are described in detail. So if we want to know the property of the polar x jet, I recommend to read it. So unfortunately, uh, Dr. Sako does not publish most of, his, uh, most of his main results in the PhD uh, program. So I introduced his result related to the acceleration of the flare. <coughs> uh, sorry. So I introduced his result related to the uh, acceleration of the flow from his PhD thesis. So his PhD can be obtained from this URL. Please check it. <coughs> Sorry. So uh, first result is a regional dependency of the jet. He measures the temperature of the jet occurred in the active region, coronal hole, and the quiet sun. So the histogram shows up uh, the result. So blue indicates the coronal hole, and the green indicates the quiet sun, and the red uh, indicates the jet occurred in the polar uh, uh, jet occurred in the active regions. The average temperature of the jet in the active region is 3.6 megakelvin. On the other hand, the average temperature of the coronal hole at quiet sun is 1.6 megakelvin. So jet, is, jet in the quiet sun and the coronal hole are cooler than the, that in the active regions. So that difference would be caused by the difference of the mighty field strength. It is one of the reasons why we could not find the jets in polar coronal hole from SXT image. So Yoko SXT does not have a sensitivity for the plasma that is lower than 2 megakelvin. So the temperature of a polar jet is not high enough to detect the uh, uh, SXT images. This page shows the main result of his, <coughs> his thesis. So he measured uh, apparent velocity and the temperature of jets occurred in the each regions. And uh, let Asterisk indicates the jet in the active region, blue one indicates the jet in coronal hole, and the green one indicates the jet in the quiet sun. So he also the line that indicates the parameter region permits the, by the theoretical and the observation result of the evaporation flow and the magnetic driven flow. So in the magnetic driven flow, the acceleration mechanism by the single slingshot effect and the mighty pressure are indi induced, uh, in, 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 included. Uh, in the paper, we do not divide them. So this, these two lines, this two line indicated the uh, parameter area uh, for evaporation, evapor evaporation flow. And uh, basically the evaporation flow is uh, hotter and uh, slower than the magnetic driven flow. And the uh, two line indicated the parameter area for uh, a magnetic, magnetic, magnetic driven flow. 
So thanks to the time cadence, we can detect the jet that the velocity is nearly 1,000 km per second. So we succeed in the detecting the high speed, jet, uh, high speed jet predicted in the MHC simulation. So the question of the solar X-ray jet in the 1990s, one, the first one is solved in my doctor's thesis by the confirmed that the solar X-ray jet in the active regions are evaporation flow. And the second one is solved by the uh, doctor uh, thesis by the classified of solar X-ray jet into the evaporation flow and the magnetic, magnetic driven flow. However, new questions are rising by SACO's result. First, uh, the Fisher et al. 1985 revealed that uh, there are two types in the evaporation flow. One is the gentle evaporation. In this case, the heat flux balances to the radiative loss in chromosphere. Hence, temperature of the chromosphere material is not increasing dramatically. The velocity of the upward upflow is very slow, about 30, 30 km per second. The other one is explosive evaporation. In the case, the heat flux is significantly larger than the radiation, radiative loss. The temperature is suddenly increased and the high velocity, upward, upward velocity is created. So considering the velocity of the solar X-ray jet, the explosive, ex explosive uh, evaporation <coughs> is a candidate of the acceleration mechanism. But to cause the explosive evaporation over the 10 to the 10th heat of 10, 10 to the 10th uh, square centimeter per second uh, heat flux is required. The limitation for explosive, event, uh, ex explosive evaporation also appeared in my hyd hydrodynamics simulation performed in my PhD thesis. However, Sarko's result reveals that the heat conduction flux of the most jet is significantly smaller than 10 to the 10th, 10 to the 10th. This is a, a result, so this is a 10 to the 8th, and this is a 7, and this is a 10 to the 6th. So in the magnetic driven jet case, it is not matter. But the shortage of the heat flux can be seen even in the jet classified evaporation flow. So I talk about uh, this region, this region. So the Grave Hatch region is a parameter area of Shimonjo and Shibata uh, in SXT era. The temperature under jet is, uh, temperature of the jet, SXT jet is higher than the jet observed with XRT. And the estimated heat flux of the most of the jet observed with the Yoko SXT exceeded 10 to the 10th per uh, square centimeter per second. So hence, this issue did not appear in Yoko era. The other issue is that both type of jet are produced in the same site within the short time scale. The image shows that two jets using a red and a green control. Green control uh, indicates the first jet occurred with 136 UT. The velocity is 690 km per second, and the temperature is, temperature is 4.5 mega Kelvin. Based on this uh, parameter, we classified it into the magnetic driven jet, driven flow. So red contour indicates the second jet, occurred at 144 UT. The velocity is 260 km per second, and the temperature is 3.2 mega Kelvin. Based on this parameter, we classified it into the evaporation flow. The time difference, only eight minutes. So the magnetic field might not be changed dramatically. Why does the difference cause? So we would miss important portion for understanding the acceleration of jet. So it is a non-thermal particle. So Leap Eta 2015 suggests that based on the hydrodynamic simulation, that's a lower energy electron. Lower energy means that less than 20 keV are important for causing explosive, explosive evaporation Fischer et al. assumes that the energy of the electron is over the 20 keV. The plot shows the threshold of energy flux. The plot shows the uh, this plot shows the uh, energy flux, threshold of energy flux and the uh, electron density, uh, electron energy. So Leap et al. said that lower energy electron suddenly heat up the material near the transition region and cause explosive evaporation. So non-thermal particle, uh, particle, non particles and the particle acceleration are key for understanding the acceleration of the flow in solar X-ray jets. So it also, it also means we can investigate the efficiency of the particle acceleration using sol solar X-ray jets. So jet frequently occurs rather than the solar flare. 
So the study has a possibility to, to give the breakthrough of the particular accession studies. So of course, we already have some result of the observing non-thermal electron in solar X-ray jet. Kundu et al. 1995 and 1998 shows the acceleration association of the type three bus showing the this panel. So this uh, cross indicated the radio source observed in the Nancy radio heliograph and this one is the jet. So this source uh, near the jet, near the jet. And the Kundu et al. 1999 found the 17 galaxy radio source at the foot point of solar X-ray jet. And uh, Kruka et al. 2011 found the non-thermal hard X-ray emission from the foot point of solar X-ray jet. So it is a legit, legit fact that, that the particle acceleration occurred in the solar X-ray jet. But the sensitivity and the special resolution of these radio and the hard X-ray instrument are not enough for achievement of my topics. But now we have ALMA. So ALMA is the largest radio interfe interferometer in the world for the observing, uh, observing celestial, uh, celestial object. So most important point for me, for us, solar observation be, can be carried out with some limitation. So I started the develop development of ALMA solar observation with some member of the Joint ALMA Observatory in 2010. And in 2013, we succeeded in the synthesizing the first solar image from the ALMA interferometric data. The left panel shows a group photo just after the succeeding in the solar image synthesis. So in the photo, solar feast only me. The other, other people, uh, engineer was a non-solar solar scientist. After the, this success, the international development team for the solar observation with ALMA is established in 2014. Uh, the light panel shows a group photo when we held a uh, solar commissioning campaign uh, in 2015. So all person is a, uh, the solar physicist. So due to the international team, the development was progressed uh, rapidly. Then the offers of the solar uh, observation with ALMA was started in cycle, se cycle four in 19, uh, 2016. The development is continued until now. The current first priority uh, Current first priority is a, a development is a, a current first priority of the development is a Stokes V measurement with a hundred gigahertz. So it is uh, sorry. So of course I propose the observation to investigate the particle acceleration in uh, solar X-ray jet and uh, succeed in the getting ALMA telescope time in cycle four. So it is ALMA iris and the SDO image of my ALMA project. So this is the ALMA image. It's a, this uh, live near the uh, equator. This is a disk and a blank sky. And this image is, uh, this movie shows a uh, difference from the 10 minutes average. This is the iris, uh, silicon, uh, carbon, and magnesium. And uh, this is a AIA, a UV continuum, helium-304, and ion 193. So the, my target of the, this project is an x bright point showing the Y93 images. I hope that x bright point is activated and produce solar X-ray jet. But unfortunately, there are some issues of the ALMA solar operation in cycle four. The actual observing time is significantly shorter than the request one. So hence, the x bright point does not produce any activation activity in the ALMA observing period. However, we succeed in observing a speak near the edge of the field of view for this one, Just this one. So we succeed in the observing of SPQ. So it is expanding move view around the move SPQ. So from the, this data, we estimate the physical parameter based on the simple assumption. So the millimeter wave from the chromospheric is satisfied the LT condition. So hence, we can estimate the physical parameter relatively easier than the estimate from the UV and the optical lines. It is a great advantage of the ALMA observation. The result is published in the APJ letter in January. So of course, it is not my goal. So my final goal is overlap the radio intensity and the spectral map with high time cadence on the such X-ray image and answer why the particular acceleration is turned on. So unfortunately, it is at this time is the deepest time of the solar minimum now. So there is no active region, and there is no good target for my student study. So finally, I mentioned the near the future process of solar observation with ALMA. 
So already you know the, the plot is a long-term variation, transport number, so we can now hear. So in next few years, we can see that some large, uh, we can catch a flare with alpha. So, so, so ANIMA would observe the solar flare in next several years, and we will tackle the mystery of the particle acceleration in solar flare using ALMA data. It is a huge up uh, of the solar observation with ALMA. So I'm, I summarized my talk, but the uh, time is uh, OK. <laughs> OK, so, so my, sci uh, my scientific career was started from the looking for the solar exeget from the uh, Yoko Bubi. But the, my first paper is the most cited paper in my, paper, in my papers, so I want to op overcome it. So it's my motivations. <laughs> and the solar exit can be classified into the two types by the temperature and the velocity. One is the evaporation flow, the other one manic driven flow. And the chromosphere evaporation in my solar exit might be controlled by the efficiency of the particle acceleration, so in, mag in magnetic recognition. And uh, in next solar maximum, cycle 25, so we will observe the solar exit and flare with ALMA, and uh, we will tackle the mystery of the particle acceleration. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Shimozu san. Very excellent overview on the X ray jets. Thank you. So, time for a question. Of course, first, uh, <laughs> Shimozu san. <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you. A very nice talk. And, uh, uh, actually, uh, today's talk is uh, uh, the best, one of the best talk, your talk, <laughs> I have heard. <laughs> and, uh, uh, yeah, actually, I learned uh, your uh, uh, work, non-thermal uh, uh, related work. That is new for me. And, uh, and also, uh, your students, Sako's uh, analysis, very nice analysis. And uh, my many questions, but uh, I wanted to ask you one comment. You, you, in, in your talk, you introduced blow, blowout jet model yep. <laughs> by Moa Star Saring. So. Would you please give me your comment about that? <laughs> so it's a, 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 the new, new, new item for, from uh, their result is a cool material with a solar x jet. So this is a new thing. Uh, but uh, the magnetic configuration is already predicted to you in the 1997. So therefore, the not, uh, only difference is a cool material or the hot material, I think. OK. So uh, I, I want to uh, ask uh, young uh, researchers, uh, please read uh, Shimojo -san, Saku -san's papers, more than studying more papers. <laughs> Okay, uh, Julia, I'm mean, sorry. Uh, Julia, yeah, thank sorry, you. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> I mean, Helen, Helen. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I've, I've been confused with some people, I, but I've never I, been I confused with I have to go, Julia. I have one step up. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I just, uh, very nice talk. Thank, thank you, much. wonderful talk. Um, I just wanted to bring your attention to the work of, of one of our students, Sargam Muli. I think Shabata-san has, has met her. She came originally here from Mayuka, and she came and did a PhD with us in Cambridge. And she's done some really good work on jets, looking at spectroscopic okay, observations yeah. of jets, but also correlating with the radio observations, imaging observations here from um, NCAR in, in Ayuka too. So um, she's seen correlations between type 3 and, and jets, but yeah, also, yeah, yeah. as they say, she has a paper in press which is looking at imaging observations from the radio uh, with jets and correlating with, with iris and ice. Yeah. Okay, Arnav? Uh, yeah, first, uh, congratulations and best wishes in your efforts in overcoming the citations of your first <laughs> paper. <laughs> anyway, so I have a question of, uh, about chromospheric evaporation. Is there some, uh, much idea of what happens to the material which evaporates? Uh, does the substantial part of it again settles back to the solar surface, or is it uh, carried away by the solar wind? What happens to the material? Oh. <laughs> Yeah, so, so relative to the solar wind, we in the so in this paper, so we considering the solar, uh, the evaporation from the exaggerated contribute to the solar wind, 
but uh, I count, we count it as a density and the mass for, from the uh, provide from the jet is not enough for the solar wind. Therefore, the so evaporation uh, caused by solar X-ray jet cannot uh, provide uh, material for the all solar window. But uh, we can, uh, we under, uh, we considering the uh, such as polar X-ray jet uh, cause a uh, perturbation in the solar wind. Yeah, Zhang Chul. Okay, uh, we really enjoyed your talk. Thank you very much for a nice uh, presentation. Uh, my question is about the relative importance between uh, thermal conduction and non thermal particles. So how can you uh, uh, evaluate the importance of each contribution? Yeah, so... So is we already uh, measured the heat conduction flux from the soft X-ray data. So in this case, is, uh, we, we already know that the number is a lack for the causing uh, ex explosive e evaporation. So I want to know the, like a dark energy sink. So in this case, I, at first I was thinking, uh, so dark energy is a non some particle. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Julia? Hello, I have a short comment and a question. The comment is to answer his question, which is, Basically, what Sarga Mulai did, uh, she looked at her low temperature emission from iris and other instruments, and we found that most of the emission in the jets, in the active region jets, is actually coming from very low temperature plasma, which is not there before the jet. And this is all chromospherically evaporated material, which leaves the, the sunspot region and goes into the heliosphere. And it's very clear, it's very strong emission. It's the same, similar thing like in France, but in this case, actually goes into the, I agree with you that it's not enough, of course, to explain yeah, yeah. the solar wind. I mean, it's just, uh, but, yeah, but so it definitely yeah. goes. In. The, this, the question I have is about these non-thermal effects. I mean, if, the, if it's a similar thing like when you have a flare, you have non-thermal electrons, then you would expect also part of the effect will be to higher, enhance the temperature, basically, at the, at the chromospheric evaporation site. But we don't see any evidence in most of the jets we've been studying that there's any temperature above a few million degrees. There are occasionally, there are some cases where we saw you know, high temperatures like in proper flares, like 10 million degrees. But normally, as, as you also found from the XST, that you know, the temperatures are not the temperatures that you have for even a B-class flare, a small B-class flare has temperatures of over 10 million degrees, but these ones, they don't reach very high temperatures. So you, wouldn't you expect these effect if there were non-thermal electrons? I'm not sure. So uh, in the my, uh, the, from a software said observation, we cannot get is, uh, such a high temperature, also you already mentioned. But uh, so, so I think uh, such a soft X -ray jet, uh, jet is a very small event, and the time scale very small. Therefore, the might we we might miss the such a high temperature signal from the uh, soft X -ray jet. Therefore, the we need to the direct uh, observation, uh, direct uh, uh, how to say, it? Uh, sorry, I need to the uh, high cadence and uh, high uh, spectral observation of the soft X-ray, in soft X-ray uh, uh, wavelength range. So therefore, the, uh, we, uh, we, and I and the, uh, I and the collaborator, uh, Progress is a new uh, hard X-ray satellite project. Uh, Shimizan already uh, mentioned about the Phoenix. So I, I also uh, hope to the Phoenix observe the soft X-ray jet, uh, soft -ray jet and uh, found, uh, found some uh, evidence with high, uh, high temperature plasma in solar X-ray jet. Yeah, maybe also with the ALMA combined, if you find the jets, that may also answer this. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we are closing quickly, but again, I'm provoking what Shibata-san has uh, said. There is a model by Alfonso Starling and more about the mini prominence eruption. So for the younger colleagues to debate again, it's very similar to type 1 and type 2 speculates, <laughs> which again, uh, he provoked the community to work on. Uh, so without much delay, uh, I will invite uh, Durgesh to make few announcements, and we still have some time, so we'll reconvene here at 11.30 after the announcements. Um, so you can collect your uh, receipt for the registration fee outside of the desk. 
Um, the certificates, if you have not given your details, please do send that email uh, and you can collect the participant participation certificate tomorrow uh, after lunch. Um, if you wanted to convert money, the guy will be here between one and two uh, in front of the office. And let's go for coffee. We'll reconvene at 11.30. Okay, uh, so I, I'm ready, I've prepared. I've prepared all the slides. Uh, do I need to share my screen now? Yes. Okay.
Yes, yes. Okay, no problem. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, I'm staying at home now. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. You make this possible to do this remote talk. I thought I would miss this meeting. Yes. Okay, about 20 minutes? No no problem. Okay, let, I'll connect to, to you later.
Hello, Bob. Nice to see you here. Okay, I see. <laughs> hi, hi, Mike. Uh, can, can you see my camera view on, on the big screen? Okay, okay, I see. I just want to make sure. Ah, I we we have to stay at home. We cannot go to the office at this time. Uh, until now, I I, I know uh, until maybe twenty February twenty fifth. Yes, it's very nice. I, I can still uh, present this talk. I don't know. That's very, <laughs> very hard for them. Okay, thank you. Hello. Hello. Hi. Oh, can, can you see the sign when I hold it? Yes, five. And three, okay? Three. Okay. So, so uh, okay. So, so you have twenty-five minutes, and we we'll leave five minutes for discussion. So at okay. twenty at twenty minutes, I will hold up the five-minute sign. All right, all right. Yeah. Okay. Hi everyone. Uh, okay. Hope you had a good coffee break. Uh, I have been told that we are going to stay on time. So, so please. 
get settled and we will continue session three. Uh, we have an invited talk by Yang Guo on uh, from nonlinear force free field models to data driven magneto hydrodynamic simulations. Uh, he is presenting remotely, so if you have a question, I encourage you to run down here and then ask the question there so that he can see you and, and hear your question. Okay, uh, Yang, go ahead. Hello, good no, everyone. Uh, I'm, I'm just kidding. Uh, I just want to show you my daily life. I, in fact, I could put off my mask safely and I cannot inspect you because I'm behind the screen. Uh, I, I'm very glad to have this chance to present my talk here. And especially I want to thank Professor uh, Dergish Tripathi. Uh, thank you very much for all uh, your efforts to make this meeting successful. Um, our works are done in collaboration with uh, Chen Xia from Yunnan University, Roddy Kepens from KU Leuven, and some other colleagues from Nanking University. The content will include the introduction, and then I'll introduce uh, our magnetofrictional module in MPI MRVAC, and also the applications of the nonlinear phosphor field models. And the next, I'll introduce our data-driven MHD simulations, including observations, the MHD model, and our results. And finally, a summary. So our general uh, motivation is to study the region structures and the dynamics of many solar activities, and also study the physical mechanisms of MHD instabilities and magnetic reconnection. And because of uh, these spatial physical parameters in the solar corona, the three-dimensional magnetic field dominates all the dynamics in the corona. So the magnetic diffusion uh, can be neglected there. Magnetic field is frozen to the plasma. Electric current is parallel to the magnetic field. Uh, these are the first three conditions. Uh, in such circumstance, both the magnetic topology and its dynamics important in the corona. But there are still many difficulties uh, to measure the magnetic field in the corona. The emissions and the field strains are very weak there, and the temperature is very high. So it produces a very wide spectral line, uh, which covers the splitting of the Zima effect. And also the corona is optically thin, and all the observables are integrations along the line of sight. So uh, usually we need a model uh, to describe the coronal magnetic field. And here are some examples. Uh, we have analytic solutions, MHD simulations, and magnetic field extrapolations. For example, the Tidolf Demelin model, and uh, this uh, MHD simulation by James Leake, and also a nonlinear phosphor field model uh, showing the figure. And for the MHD simulations, there is a spatial class uh, of them. The common feature of these simulations is that they all use a nonlinear phosphor field uh, model as the initial condition and then uh, do the MHD simulation. So we call this spatial class uh, simulation as the data driven or the data constrained MHD simulation model. This flow chart uh, shows how we study the solar activities. Uh, first, we use multi wavelength observations and then construct three dimensional magnetic fields and then uh, data driven MHD simulation. And finally, we may analyze the, the, the topology and the compute the helicity of the magnetic field model. So, for the non linear force field models, it is derived from the MHD momentum equation, if we omit the initial term, the, the pressure term, and also the gravity term, that only J cross B equals zero left. And we have many numerical methods uh, to compute such models. For example, the upward integration method, the optimization method, the MHD relaxation, grant rubbing, and also a Green's function method. Here, we only focus on two of them. Uh, the first is the optimization method, 
which was proposed uh, by Wheatland, Sturrock, Rumeliotis. Uh, they proposed objective function L uh, and then involved this uh, uh, function to zero. And if L approaches zero, then both the false free condition and the divergence free, uh, divergence free condition are satisfied, then we get an uh, optimized nonlinear false free model. And the second is the MHD relaxation method. Uh, in this method, they, they consider the momentum equation first uh, and only the, the J cross B plus the dissipative term are considered. And if uh, we choose the dissipative term as the frictional form, uh, then we can ask a require the velocity proportional to, to the Lorentz force. And in su such case, the velocity is gu guaranteed uh, to decrease because it's uh, pro pro proportional to the Lorentz force. And in this way, the magnetic field will involve to a force free state. And our goal is to develop a nonlinear force field model in this MPI MAVAC uh, MHD simulation code. So we want to implement a new uh, extrapolation code and also want to get the beta divergence and the force free metrics and to deal with this high spatial resolution and the large field view data observed by modern instruments such as uh, STO HMI. And finally, we will also want to combine this nonlinear force field model with MHT simulations seamlessly. Then uh, we solve this force free equation uh, using the magnetic friction uh, method and write a magnetic friction module in MPI MRVAC. Uh, and it is a MHT simulation framework uh, which includes multi numerical algorithms and also multi physics modules. And it, uh, it is also parallelized by MPI and has the ability of adaptive mesh refinement. So the magnetic frictional module in MPI MRVAC could derive nonlinear fault model in both Cartesian, spherical uh, coordinates, also in uniform adaptive mesh refinement uh, and stretch the grid points. And, and we have also applied uh, this method to real observations. And next we'll show some uh, examples of the application of the nonlinear falsehood models. First, uh, we study the quasi separatrix layers uh, around a flux rope. We can find this flux rope is surrounded uh, by a QSL. So we could use QSLs to define the boundary of a flux rope. And we could also study uh, the high temperature emission in the corner with this model and QSLs. Uh, the left movie shows the ARA 94 astrum emission, and this lower right movie shows the three dimensional QSLs. Um, we can see the shape of these QSLs resemble the, the high temperature emission very well. Uh, so it suggests uh, magnetic connection occurs in these three-dimensional QSLs and heating the corona. And we could study this corona heating problem uh, more quantitatively using nonlinear force field models. Here, we propose a non-ideal velocity, which is defined as the deviation of the corona uh, motion with dissipation compared to that without dissipation uh, as shown by this n1 prime to this n1, then divided by, ti by time, we get this non-ideal velocity, and the heating flux is proportional to this velocity, and also to this torsional parameter alpha. Uh, so we could compute the heating um, rate at the bottom, and then if we distribute all these heating flux into the corona, and we could uh, uh, compute the emissions in different uh, ARA EUV wave bands, 
the, the left column shows the emission uh, observed by AIA and the right it, is reconstructed uh, by our models. So the reconstructed coronal uh, emission resembles, reproduces the observations very well. And the final example uh, is, is the flare ribbon, multi flare, uh, multi ribbon flares as shown by this figure. Uh, we have uh, a very complicated shape uh, of flare ribbons. And then if we compute the pure cells on the bottom and also the three dimensional magnitude, um, we find these pure cells and three dimensional magnetic structures could explain these complicated flare ribbons. So next, data-driven MHD simulations. In this study, we want to study, uh, uh, in this work, we want to study the build-up triggering and the driving processes of magnetic flux ropes. Uh, and also we want to know the roles of ideal and non-ideal processes in the flux rope eruption. And probably we could also predict a flux rope eruption. So we develop a data-driven MHC model and study the mechanisms of the uh, flux rope eruption here. Uh, it is a C-class flare uh, occurred in active region triple one, two, three. And we have uh, studied the magnetic topology of this active region and find many null points in this active region. And these 304 astro movie shows the eruption of the filament. Uh, could also see some flare ribbons, complicated flare ribbons and flare loops here. Uh, so our, our goal is to reproduce uh, at least the dynamics of this filament eruption. And this movie shows the evolution of the uh, magnetic field observed by, by SDOHMI uh, in a period of, uh, of about two days. But in the MHD simulation, we, we only studied uh, a time range of about two hours. And the governed equations include this uh, mass conservation, momentum conservation, and magnetic induction equation. But here we use a simple zero beta MHD model where the gas pressure uh, P is, is assumed to be zero. And also uh, we have uh, some source terms on the right hand side of these three equations. In our latest studies, uh, we found that all these source terms can be uh, neglected, but we can still reproduce the main features uh, of the dynamics. And the equations are solved by MPI and MAVAC. So first, we compute a nonlinear phosphor model in this black box uh, as shown here. Uh, and the bottom figures show the comparison of the reconstructed third lines with uh, the kernel loops in 171 astrum and also the comparison of the third lines with the filament in this 304 astrum. And, uh, if we look into the core of this active region, we could find some boosted and shaped third lines as shown by the yellow line, uh, yellow lines, and also some large uh, electric current along this polarity version line as shown by these white isosurfaces. And we also need um, a density a density distribution <clears throat> as the initial condition here. We assume a two-step function of the temperature, uh, but just use it to, to compute this density profile. And this figure summarizes uh, all the initial conditions. So now we have the nonlinear force field in this three-dimensional box, and also the density distribution uh, as shown on these meshes. Uh, and also we have the, the vector magnetic field on the bottom observed by SDOHMI. And for the boundary condition, we prepared two different cases. Um, first, the data-driven boundary, uh, but let's only focus on the velocity and the magnetic field on the bottom. So in the data-driven case, the velocity on the bottom is the velocity field derived by this dev for vm code. It is a velocity inversion code. Um, 
that can derive the velocity from, uh, from a series of vector magnetic fields. Also, the magnetic field on the bottom um, is the observed data. So for the data constraint case, the velocity on the bottom is always zero, as the magnetic field is always the initial data. So this movie shows uh, the evolution of the magnetic field lines. We could see the eruption of this flux rope. And these, uh, these figures should four snapshots uh, of this simulation. And, and we compare the QSLs on the bottom uh, with observations in 304 and 1,600 astron, uh, we find part of these QSLs, uh, like these parts, uh, coincide with the locations of the, of the flare ribbons. And we also compare the, the fault lines uh, with these time series uh, of 304 astron uh, image. We find this model we produce observation uh, in at least three different aspects. First, the shape of these foot lines looks very similar to the shape of the uh, filament material. And also the eruption uh, direction is similar. And finally, the eruption range is also similar. They both reaches uh, to this very high, high range. And also we could compare um, the, the model and observation more quantitatively. Uh, this panel, panel A, shows the distance time diagram uh, derived by 304, 304 observations. And in panel B, we trace the apex of the magnetic flux rope. Uh, and if we, we project this high time uh, profile onto the observations at the show in panel C, we find that uh, both the models and observations show two different phases of this uh, distance time uh, diagram profile. <clears throat> they both have a slow rising phase and also a, a very fast erupting phase. And of course, uh, the, the simulations shows that uh, it erupts, the flux rope erupts about 20 minutes earlier than the observation. And the velocity uh, is a little bit smaller than the observation. So this leaves some room uh, to improve our MHD model. <clears throat> but still, we, we, <clears throat> we find uh, some similarities here. And finally, we compute the decay index along uh, the, the, the erupting paths of this filament. We find that the decay index crosses this critical value at a height where the eruption the eruption transits from this slow rising phase to this fast erupting phase and uh, finally in this case two the data constraint case uh, we find the simulation result is very similar to the data driven case uh, and we do not show the detailed uh, detailed analysis here so uh, summary, and in our studies, uh, we use multi-wavelength observations and use three-dimensional magnetic field models and also these data-driven MHD simulations uh, and the topology analysis, holistic computation uh, to study the solar activities. We combine, uh, combine all these different um, methods, both from observations and uh, uh, numerical models. And we develop a magnetofriction model in MPI and MAVAC. Uh, and this code uh, works in both Cartesian sphere coordinates in uniform, adaptive mesh refinement, and a stretched grid. Uh, and we could use these models to study uh, magnetic topology of uh, flux, rope, uh, flux ropes, uh, coronal brightening and heating, and also the morphology of flare ribbons. And we develop a data-driven MHD model using zero beta approximation. And this model could reproduce uh, the, the erupting uh, process of a flux rope. And also we find a data-constrained boundary condition could reproduce a similar simula uh, simulation result as the data-driven case. So thank you very much. That's all.
Thanks, Yang. Uh, that's a very interesting talk, and you are um, finishing very early. So we have plenty of time for questions. Hi, Bob. Oh, hello. Can you hear me, Yang? Yes. All right. Uh, thanks for that. It was a really good summary of, of your work and a, a broad, more broadly of work in the field. I just wanted to ask about something you said at the start, which uh, you mentioned both a, a data-driven approach and a data-constrained approach. Can you just explain yeah. what the difference is? So let, let me... Uh, the slides. Oh. Sorry, I make it go too far. So for the data driven for the data driven uh, boundary condition, both the velocity and the magnetic field on the bottom are the time series uh, data from the observation. Uh, but for the data constraint uh, boundary condition, the velocity is always zero on the bottom and the magnetic field is always um, the initial observed data. Uh, so in, in data driven case, we have to know uh, all the observation in advance uh, to do the simulation, but in the data-driven boundary condition, we do not need uh, all these observed, uh, observed data. So in this uh, case, the means we could use this data constraint model to predict uh, to predict eruption of flux rope, but uh, we cannot predict with data-driven boundary condition because in this case we need uh, all, all these uh, observations in advance. Thank you. Uh, other questions? Okay. Uh, thank you very much for uh, Gosan. So this is speaking in Norway. So I want to ask uh, about a boundary condition uh, of the data constraint MAT simulation. So you, but your boundary condition is uh, set the uh, regarding the magnetic field, uh, fix the initial observed data. So you mean, is this uh, actually horizontal magnetic field is also fixed during, during the calculation? In that case, so I think magnetic helicity is not conserved, conserved. so what do you think? Hey, hey uh, I'm sorry, I, I cannot hear very clearly in the, in the later part. Oh, yes. So, uh, in, actually, uh, regarding to the boundary condition of uh, your magnetic field, so uh, your magnetic field uh, fixed to uh, the initial observed data. So, uh, this means the uh, uh, horizontal magnetic fields are also fixed at the initial value. So, in that case, during the calculation, I think that the magnetic helicity is not conserved. So, what do you think? I, I can only guess your question. So you ask about this data constraint yes, uh, yes. boundary condition. Yes, yes. And uh, in this case, we, we also have an initial, uh, initial data. The in initial data is, uh, is got by, by the nonlinear force field model uh, extrapolated with the same magnetic field, with this same magnetic field as the initial, also uh, as the boundary condition. I mean, we use these observed magnetic field at one snapshot for both the boundary condition uh, of this uh, MHD simulation and for the for the nonlinear force field model for both these two models. Um, I mean, in this case, uh, it, it it seems it's consistent, and also the the eruption process later, uh, I think, it only affected by all the information stored in the kernel, uh, but does not affect by the boundary very much. I mean, in these, uh, in these, uh, these simulations where the, the time range is not too long, it's only two hours before, maybe one hour before the eruption. But if you 
study a very long uh, time simulation like uh, weeks or months, then we have to use data-driven uh, boundary condition. You have to update the information of the boundary. But if you study a, a case where, where the initial condition is very close to the eruption, you don't need uh, to update the border boundary. Okay. Hi, uh, in the previous slide, you mentioned uh, coronal heating with NLFF models. Uh, could you please explain more about that? How do you study that? Okay. <clears throat> I mean, the, uh, indeed, this is a re really a very complicated model. Uh, we do not show all the details here. It's a very uh, a brief, very brief introduction. I mean, uh, we have the formula. The formula was proposed, I think, by Dana Lanko, um, where the heating on the bottom is proportional uh, at least to, to four different parameters. First, it is proportional to this non-ideal velocity, as shown here. And second, uh, the heating flux, heating rate is proportional to this torsional parameter alpha it can be computed by by observations and the third the heating rate uh, is proportional to, to the magnetic field strains uh, squared and the force the heating rate is proportional to the to the width to the width of a, a elementary flux tube like here we will choose these widths to be 160 kilometers so all these four um, all these four different parameters can be um, derived by observations uh, somehow. Uh, and of course, the most difficult part is this uh, non-ideal velocity. And here we have to uh, compute two non-linear phosphate models. And also we have to trace the, the velocity on the bottom. Uh, and then we could compute the difference of, of these two models like this, this uh, N0 to N1 prime and N0 to N1, then the difference is this part. And with uh, this difference, we, we derive the velocity. And if we get all this information, all the heating rate, the latter part is rel relatively simple. And in this part, we simply, we use a very simple model. Uh, like we distribute the heating flux exponentially into these uh, uh, kernel loops. Of course, these kernel loops are derived by nonlinear force field model itself. Uh, and then we solve uh, energy balance equation, like we consider conduction, radiation, and heating. And then we get density temperature here. And with density temperature, and also the EIA uh, response function, we, we could compute the emission, the EV emission. Okay, that's it. Okay. Um, I, I oh okay. Dogesh has one question. Last question. So in this slide here, um, you seem to be reproducing well the core of the active regions, but not the the peripheral loops in one seventy one, for example. So what do you think is the, could be done to do that? I, I think the the. The largest limit here, we, we could only compute the closed loops, cannot compute the open loop. So that's why these uh, long loops here, we, we get nothing about that. It's all black. We simply do not have data here. You're right. Okay. We, we cannot do, yeah. Well, with that, Yang, uh, thanks very much for your talk. Uh, we, we hope you can uh, also enjoy some of the other talks in this meeting, even though you are remotely. So uh, again, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. So we have uh, four more contributed talks. Uh, the next one is uh, by Abhishek Reithans uh, on modeling of I see brightenings.
Hello everyone, I will be presenting my work on modeling of high sea brightenings. I have been working with my supervisor Durgesh Tripathi and my co-supervisor Vinay Al Kashyap. To begin with, high sea is a sounding rocket mission of NASA. It observes the sun in 193 angstrom, basically getting emission from the 12th ionized state of iron atom formed at a temperature of around a million Kelvin. High C has a very high spatial resolution of around 0.03 arc second. Uh, these are two images of the same region, one taken in AIA in the same wave band of 193 angstrom, and the other one is taken in high C. As we can see that the image on uh, the image on uh, right is much more clear than the image on left, but high C, just like any other sounding rocket mission, is severely constrained by the amount of time for which data is provided. And AIA, despite having a lower resolution, can provide continuous data at a cadence of 12 seconds, and because of which it, it becomes much more uh, easier to address science goals if both such instruments are used in conjunction with each other. HiC observed many important features, uh, some for the first time, and one of them, uh, not for the first time, uh, but one of the very important features which were observed by HiC were transient brightenings in great details. And uh, transient brightenings are important because of the high frequency at which they occur. Roughly, it's around one every uh, three minutes in the active region and one every hour in the quieter regions of the sun. Uh, because of this, High frequency, we, one might expect that they can play a role in coronal heating. And uh, since these transient brightenings correspond to loops, at least in this study, close to the transition region, so it can help in understanding the coupling of various regions of solar atmosphere better. The, this square box is the field of view of high C. And the inner square box, which has been zoomed here, shows the field of study, which was uh, shows the region which was studied in by Subramanian et al. in 2018. And they identified 27 point-like brightenings in this region. And they used simultaneous and co-aligned observations from HiC and AIA to perform thermal diagnostics. And what they found was that conduction was the dominant mechanism of cooling. They estimated the energy budget on the basis of magnetic fields there. And they found that radiation only accounted for uh, not more than 10% of the total energy budget. This has implications because all the energy estimation of events is done only on the basis of radiation loss. And this is a curve which shows the flaring frequency versus uh, flaring energy. And all the energy which is plotted on x-axis is done only on the basis of light curves. And if it's the case that conduction is actually more dominant than radiation, then we might be underestimating the budget for such energetic events. Since there were a number of uh, assumptions involved in the modeling, uh, involved in the analysis of data, so the next step was to numerically verify these uh, uh, findings from data. And for that, we have used a code named EPTEL. It's a zero D code. So before I discuss my results, I would like to uh, briefly discuss what a zero-D code does. Um, this line is actually the base of coronal part of the loop. Below it, we have transition region, and above it, we have the coronal region. So this base is defined as the region above which conduction is a cooling term, and below which conduction is a heating term. And these arrows indicate the field aligned coordinates. This is the top of the loop, and the loop is assumed to be symmetric about this axis. And because of symmetry, all the vector quantities here, they become essentially zero. Uh, for, symmetry makes the simulation easier. We have to simulate only half of the loop, and heating is assumed to be happening close to the loop top. And because of very high conduction time scales, heating becomes uniform quickly. So EPTEL assumes uniform heating function. It does not simulate for the time period between localized heating and uh, uniform heating, but it simulates afterwards. The image on the, and yeah, this, uh, this is the spatial extent of the brightening, which in the case of the brightenings which we were interested in was two by two AIA pixels. This is an equivalent image on the, uh, this is an equivalent image of this uh, left image, where we have just straightened the system and uh, 
this is the base of coronal part of the loop. What is further noted is that uh, quantities at the base and quantities at the top, they do not differ much. And if that is the case, especially since we are simulating small loops, uh, then uh, we can, instead of studying the space-time evolution of various physical parameters, we can study the time evolution of length average physical quantities. And it turns out that the, uh, the match between uh, 0D model and 1D models, they are very good, especially for smaller loops and uh, less energetic events. So this is what any 0D code basically does. So to discuss the results, we picked up three brightenings, which had single prominent peak. This was done so as to avoid the complications due to multiple heating events. And uh, for the first brightening, this uh, green curve is the high C light curve. The blue one is the uh, AIA light curve in 193 wave band. And the red curve is uh, the cross calibration result for both the instruments. This image is our forward model light curves. We took these parameters. We, we injected this much energy in this duration, in this loop length. And we had a uniform background heating so as to keep the number density and temperature close to that of t the typical value of active regions. We see that uh, for this much amount of energy injected, the radiation loss was only 10 raised to the power 23.7 ergs. This curve shows the various energetic terms. This green curve is our heating function. All quantities are in ergs per centimeter cube per second. The red curve is our uh, radiation loss. And the blue curve is the conduction loss. Uh, the conduction loss are actually more than the heating term, but that is because we have not, in this curve, shown enthalpy. Enthalpy from transition region brings extra energy into the corona. This is the conduction loss importance factor, which is defined in this format, logarithm of conduction to radiation losses. A positive value denotes conduction dom cooling dominated phase, and a negative value denotes radiation cooling dominated phase. This, this is just to show that these tiny brightenings share the same features observed for big flares and micro flares, that there is an initial conduction dominated phase, and eventually radiation takes over. So this is the result for third brightening, uh, where we had, uh, yeah, these are the light curves, the simulated light curves. And we, uh, we again got the same result, that conduction was, uh, radiation was much smaller than what the injected energy budget was. And this is for the third brightening, where again the same trend was observed. So there are some possible caveats. One is the efficiency of EPTEL. And it turns out that for the kind of small loop lengths we are interested in, because these were very transient events, and it meant that small loops were, uh, were the choice because they could be fi get filled and evacuated of plasma very fast. So for, su for such small loops, uh, EPTEL is very fairly accurate with 1D. In fact, there's 15 to 20% difference, which I have written here, that is for longer loops and big flaring events. The second assumption, which is in EPTEL, is uh, uh, heating at top, and is it justified? It turns out that heat location doesn't matter because of the very small conduction cooling time scales for these small loops. Uh, this is the reference. And uh, these are my conclusions, that we could verify that these brightenings had an initial conduction cooling dominated phase, followed by radiation, just like the big flares. And radiation loss was significantly smaller than the heating budget. And uh, conduction, it means that while estimating energy budget for any event, conduction should be taken into account. And since this energy is conducted into the lower regions of solar atmosphere, they might play an important role in heating of these lower regions. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Abhishek. Are uh, there questions from the audience? We have lots of time. Yeah. So, Vishay, you have chosen, uh, you know, high C examples uh, primarily because of the lifetime and uh, the small spatial scale. So, the question would be, can you extend your work to, you know, other kind of brightenings we commonly see from so, other instruments? Uh, actually, the uh, I mean, this result that conduction, uh, I mean, radiation is much small, uh, smaller than the energetic, uh, the energy input. 
this becomes more apparent for smaller loops. For bigger loops, that is also the case, but I think the difference will be smaller. So the question is, can you sort of uh, you know, extend yes, your yes, models yes, to yes, other kind of yes, things? Yes, you have plans for yes, that? Yes, as long as it's field aligned, we can do that. Uh, you have sh shown the for different brightenings, you have chosen the heating parameters. Yes. How do you arrive at that? So Okay, so that is just uh, to give uh, correspondence between the forward model light curves and the observed light curves. So this is, uh, I mean, we have to put it as an input function. It is not done by the code. So whichever, I mean, the range of heating function which gives, which gives best correspondence between the light curves observed and the forward model results. OK. The light curve is the proxy for you to yes, get that. Yes. OK. Thank you. Um, are there other questions? Uh, I have one. So uh, how do you plan to uh, extend this work into the future? Uh, I think uh, we'll go for better models because Eptel Though I don't think it will make much difference because we checked for the correspondence between 1D and 0D for such small loops, and it almost overlaps, very small difference. So, yeah. Like, uh, like 1D is, of course, better than 0D. And so on 2D, 3D. Okay. All right. Again, uh, thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is uh, Kamlesh Bora. I hope I pronounced that uh, fairly correctly. I, he will talk about. Sorry. She will talk about development of numerical model based on Hall magnetohydrodynamics. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kamlesh Bura. Uh, I'm in third year of my PhD and working with Dr. Ramit Bhattacharya. And I'm from Physical Research Laboratory, Ahmedabad. So uh, before uh, discussing the numerical model based on Hall MHD and our preliminary results, I would like to uh, discuss what motiva motivates me to do this work or to do Hall MHD. So as you can see here, it is a solar flare a sudden rapid and intense brightening in the solar atmosphere due to the magnetic reconnection. So here on right hand side you can see that this is light curve and we mark the solar flare by impulsive phase or impulsive rise in light curve in hard x-ray. And diffusion time scale for this uh, solar flare is around 1 hour when we consider the resistivity to be Spitzer resistivity. And corresponding to do to this diffusion time scale, there is this length scale over which the magnetic reconnection happens. Or this suggests that re magnetic reconnection or resistive dissipation process should happen at this time scale, or length scale, sorry. And now I would like to uh, emphasize on the point that resistive MHD simulations and theory are unable to explain the impulsive phase and diffusion time scale of a flare. So the time scale which we get from resistive MHD uh, theory is of the order of some years. So which is not, which doesn't match well with this observed solar flare diffusion time scale. So you can see here the, these are some parameters corresponding to the resistive uh, diffusion process 
which is happening over this length scale of 60 meter and this is the Lundquist number for this uh, corresponding to this length scale which is 10 to the power 4 and uh, delta E is uh, the ion inertial scale length and delta E is the electron inertial scale length and this is plasma beta for solar corona to uh, accommodate the magnetic reconnection. So when I plug in these values in dimensionless generalized Ohm's law, the odd scaling of the dimensionless generalized Ohm's law is uh, like this. So first term is the resistive diffusion, diffusion term over which the mag due to which the magnetic reconnection is happening and uh, second term is the Hall term, third is the pressure uh, gradient term and fourth one is the electron inertial term. So you can see from here when I plug in these values in this equation, so the scaling of this resistive diffusion is 10 to the power minus 4 and Hall is 10 to the power minus 2. If I am observing the magnetic reconnection or resistive diffusion processes over this scale, so I cannot neglect the Hall term or Hall effect. So from here, one can conclude that Hall term cannot be ignored while one is observing resistive dissipation process or magnetic reconnection from this. So now I come to my numerical model, which is a ULEG Hall numerical model. ULEG is, a, uh, ULEG is an established MHD code based on implicit large eddy simulation. I have added Hall term into it and uh, explored the dynamics uh, change. So this is the induction equation in which I added the Hall term. Please note that D0 is delta I by L0, which is delta I is inertia, ion inertial scale length and L0 is the scale length over which the reconnection is taking place. So you can see here is this is the equation modified into our uh, code. So implicit large eddy simulation is good to resolve the Hall effect because of in implicit large eddy simulation the resistivity is not uh, physical, it is numerical and resistivity is driven by the grid resolution. So whatever grid I set, the resolution of grid uh, defines the resistivity in the code. With, without going into the uh, much interpretation of these equations, I would like to now discuss about uh, the scenario of fast reconnection, why these scales are, uh, scales don't match, the time scale don't match. And uh, here is a nice uh, model which is the extension of CHSKP model by Shibata sir and uh, Tanuma. So you can see that here are the oppositely directed uh, field line and there is current sheet. And in second phase, they say that this is the thinning of current sheet and which is the non-linear phase of tearing instability. And when it evolves, there is secondary tearing instability where the plasmoid generation happens. And when these plasmoids coalesce with each other, they form bigger plasmoids and this is how the macroscopic plasma scales are connected to the microscopic, uh, microscopic plasma scale and reconnection takes in between and the larger pl plasmoid is ejected out and the energy is ejected out corresponding to this uh, magnetic island or plasmoid. So this was the scenario of fast reconnection proposed by or given by uh, Shibata and Tanuma. These are some uh, references which show that this tearing instability has a larger growth rate with the Hall term and uh, as that D0, rem please remember D0 was the ratio of ion inertial scale length to the uh, characteristic scale length over which the magnetic field is varying. As this D0 increases, the Hall reconnection stage is triggered faster in time. And third, uh, third uh, which is the Amitabha Bhattacharji group, they showed this secondary islands grow faster in Hall regime, meaning this regime, this uh, secondary island, uh, these secondary islands grow faster when you include the Hall effect uh, into the picture. So now I will be showing my results which I, uh, which I um, got from my code, the, the code I uh, worked with. So you can see on the left hand side, this is the without Hall simulation and this is with Hall simulation. I will run it. So, these are the magnetic field lines and you can see the RGB here. So R is the X direction, red color arrow is the X direction, uh, green color is the Y direction and blue color is the Z direction. So this is an XZ plane which is basically 2.5 dissimulation and uh, this is projected on, uh, so 
I have plotted the field line on uh, y uh, constant plane. So if I run it, please note that this is without hull and this is with hull. You will see that here the reconnection is occur happening at these two endpoints like Y type and here which is with hull there is plasmoid generation and you can see reconnection is faster in this case and uh, this plasmoid after uh, around 4 seconds will break into two plasmoids you can see here. So the energy stored um, here the reconnection took place and the two plasmoid form. Now the auto plasmoid will reconnect with the field lines and will open up and now these two plasmoids are moving towards each other, about to collapse. So it, uh, it will run up to 10 seconds. You can see the reconnection is faster at these two ends rather than here. So let me take you to the snapshots from the Hall MHD reconnection where the important phases I have uh, uh, mentioned here. So first stage was the two plasmoid generation, then the plasmoid breaking due to the X type reconnection here, here and here and then the trailing plasmoids getting reconnected with the outer field line and opening up releasing the energy then two plasmoids about to merge towards each other. So I have plotted the current average vo volume average current density and effective resistivity. I will define the effective resistivity once after the plot is there. So you can see that this is the volume average current density which shows me the rise in current at the time of the reconnection. Reconnection is taking se place several times there and effective resistivity which is also showing me the peak. So red curve is with hall and black curve is without hall or you can say it uh, resistive MHD simulation. So this is the eta effective which is B dot curl of V cross B average minus D dt of B square average divided by B dot curl of J. So due to the hall, magnetic field and the corresponding currents are getting modified. That's why this effective resistivity is also getting modified. So summary and conclusions. Reconnection is faster with the increase in the hall field observed with our simulation and effective resistivity shows significant changes during simulation because of magnetic field and corresponding currents get modified due to Hall effect. Inclusion of Hall gives that. Future work, uh, I would like to extend the work to higher resolution to explore the small scale Hall reconnection in details. And this was the 2.5D simulation. I would like to uh, do it in for 3D and uh, explore the solar coronal transients with the Hall MHD model. Thanks. Thank you, Kamlesh. Yeah, uh, it's nice to study Hall MHD, uh, but uh, I have some very really fundamental question yeah, yeah. about numbers. Would you please show me yeah. uh, initial slide? Uh, you estimated the okay. characteristic length of a reconnection. Yeah, I remember thoughts. Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, you wrote the uh, L zero is yes. sixty meter for characteristic. Yes. Length. But how how did you estimate this? Length? Actually, the the diffusion. If you consider the process uh, to be purely resistive for reconnection, the tau d is equals to L naught by eta and their eta is the diffusivity for solar corona that is 1 meter square per second and uh, the time is 3600. Uh, that is not good. Okay. You, usually uh, we, we are based, based on the observational results yes. and the uh, special scale of uh, flares 10,000 okay. kilometers or so. So uh, when we estimate the uh, Lankis number, we usually use uh, such a 10,000 kilometer or so. Okay. Then the Lankis number or magnetic resonance number become very large. Large. So uh, uh, classical Spitzer resistivity uh, is not important, we understand. That is a problem, yeah. question. Hmm. And then uh, laboratory and magnetic plasma physicists uh, studying 
uh, microscopic plasma process mm -hmm. uh, uh, in, in a special scale of uh, uh, inertial, uh, as you say, ion inertial scale or yes. ion lamo radius, yes. electron lamo radius, or so. That is of the order of one meter or less. Then whole MHD is effective. become effective. Mm -hmm. So uh, you, you, you show the generalized Ohm's law uh, later. Yeah, that's like yes. And uh, so L0 is actually <laughs> 10 to the ninth centimeter. <laughs> so all numbers become smaller, uh, mm -hmm. 10 to the fifth. Yes. So, so all uh, uh, meaning, meaningless, much smaller than V cross B. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that is important in the real dynamics. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, whole MHD become very important in a very small scale. Yes. Ion uh, Lama radius or so. So yes. uh, therefore, the study is good. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, when applying this uh, physics to solar sort of flares, please yes. remember this discussion. Yes, exactly. Thank you, sir. As far as I remember, the whole term is not... Sir, not actually, like I can't hear you. Yes. Take it closer. It's, it's yeah. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. As far as I remember, the whole term is not a non-ideal term. So how does it uh, influence um, dissipation? No, actually, I didn't uh, get your question. The whole term is not a non-ideal term. It's not non-ideal term. Yeah, yeah. Okay. it's not a non-ideal term. Yes. So how can it in influence uh, dissipation? Um, actually, uh, due to the Hall term, at that uh, I, I forgot to mention that also the Hall effect decouples the electron and ion motion. So initially the f uh, plasma was frozen single fluid uh, approach. You consider that when plasma particles are attached to the magnetic field line, frozen in condition is uh, valid there. So at Hall scales, when delta E is comparable to the L0, the ion motion gets decoupled. And now the um, field, uh, field lines are frozen into the electron fluid only. Um, OK. Oh, wow. OK. One, one more comment. Well, uh, I should congratulate you that you're exploring the Hall effect, which is basically a two-fluid description. So both, as she said, electrons and ions are playing a role. And now with better resolution, even your island structure might get improved, and you yes. might get uh, smaller island islandlets, if you like. Yeah. But I think the next step, in my view, we should okay. carry forward yes. the partially ionized plasma. In okay. a three fluid model, electrons, okay. ions, and neutrals. And you will find, as our Stuart uh, okay. Neha is exploring as a poster, okay. that you get uh, more structure island formation. Okay. Anticipation is contributed, and the reconnection sites then become okay. very prominent. Okay. Thank you for your point, sir. But actually, uh, if I'm applying it to fully ionized plasma, fully, uh, fully ionized plasma, then uh, Ambipolar diffusion for solar coronal case is? Yes, wrestling can go to cooler atmosphere and okay, okay. invoke okay. partially okay. ionized. Thank you, sir. OK. Um, I actually have one, one, one response to Marcel. So usually, when people do the, include the whole effect, it, uh, can, it can have a runaway effect to, to increase the, the, the sharpness of the current sheets. And then you would need some other dissipative effects, like ohmic diversity, to break the connection and make it dissipative. Uh, thank you very much. The next talk will be by Zhu Yong Kang. Yeah. Uh, he will talk about the physical nature of spiral wave patterns in sunspots.
Okay, let's start my presentation. I'm Juhyung Kang in Seoul National University. I'm a PhD student, and I'm today I'm going to talk about the physical nature of spiral wave pattern observed in sunspots. Uh, what happened? Uh, okay. So the intensity and the polar velocity are the conspicuous observed <coughs> phenomenon in sunspots. So, and this oscillation has the predominant uh, period about uh, two to three minutes in the chromosphere. And this uh, oscillation are considered as the uh, slow wave propagating along the field line. And this movie show uh, the show the photospheric picture of the sunspot and the chromospheric intensity and the Doppler velocity maps. So you can see the wave pattern in here. And especially, uh, I'm interested in the horizontal pattern of this wave, and especially, I'm interested in the spiral pattern. Uh, this is, these are the spiral patterns I'm interested in. Uh, so uh, you can see the Doppler uh, <laughs> map in this movie, and uh, uh, these three are uh, observed in the one single sunspot. Uh, so you can see the spiral arm look like this red. Uh, line and uh, at first panel it rotates counterclockwise direction and the second panel there are another uh, spiral pattern that rotates uh, cl clockwise and the third panel show the uh, spiral pattern with uh, two arms like this. Uh, Considering the slow MHD wave, previous study suggests that this uh, wave pattern may be the slow wave propagating along the twisted magnetic field. But, <coughs> uh, however, this explanation cannot apply to the, my observation because, the, uh, as you can see, the, uh, the time difference between these this three uh, pattern is just about uh, 10 minutes or the 15 minutes. So if the, if the previous uh, explanation is correct, then the uh, field is quickly twisted and uh, changed the, its direction. But as you know, the sunspot has a very strong magnetic field. So it is quite difficult to uniformly twist in the low beta plasma. It's like quickly like this. Uh, then what are they? Uh, so in this study, I tried to uh, suggest a new model to explain uh, the, this observation. So in this study, I used the use a uh, uh, I analyzed the poor observed from the fast imaging solar spectrograph installed at the Goody Solar Telescope. And uh, actually, I use only this HR spectral band and to emphasize the uh, ceremony oscillation, I applied the period band best filter in frequency range uh, from 5.5 to 9 millihertz. Uh, this uh, snapshot and movie show the uh, one arm spiral pattern, and you can see the uh, arm is uh, most of the arm is move out like this radially move out, but in the near the center, the some parts of the arm is uh, move into the center. Uh, it also happened in the uh, two spiral arm case. So uh, the most of the uh, arm is radially moved out, but the center of the arm is moved into the uh, uh, center to the, this spiral pattern. 
to identify the spatial fluctuation in the atmospheric direction, uh, I apply the uh, atmospheric period transform along the, this dashed line. And the result of the period transform are shown in the right panels. So for the case of uh, spiral pattern with uh, one arm, the most of uh, wave energy concentrated on the uh, atmosphere mode m equals zero and one. But for the case of uh, uh, two arm case, most of the energy is concentrated on the m equals zero and two. And now let's move on to the modeling to explain this uh, observed the picture. I consider the uh, simple flux tube look like this. Uh, this uh, flux tube is an untwisted and non-rotating uh, homogeneous <coughs> magnetic flux tube. Uh, in this cylinder, I solve the four MHD equation look like this to derive the uh, longitudinal velocity component of the wave in the cylindrical coordinate. So these are the solution of that equation. So VG is the longitudinal velocity component, and this VG is given as the basic function J with order of M. And uh, this movie show the uh, VG component in a horizontal slab and for the <laughs> for m equals zero one and two for as you can see for the non-zero mode m the we, i can uh, describe the uh, rotating pattern like this in addition to this i assume a wave driving source is located below the photosphere in this assumption, the wave uh, first uh, propagates isotropically like this, uh, since it has a fast wave property. Uh, uh, this wave touched the vertical around one region. The, a portion of the fast wave is converted to the slow wave, and this slow wave propagates along the magnetic field line. Uh, since the uh, because of the isotropical propagation, uh, wave front, uh, uh, the near the, sorry, the wave front reach first near the source, and it reach after the uh, horizontally uh, far region. So. This arriving time can be described as a function of uh, radial distance r, as like this. So there is the d is the depth of the source, and v is the uh, yeah, propagating velocity of the fast wave in a high beta region. Uh, and then I substitute this ta term into the previous uh, uh, solution vg. Then we can rewrite the vg as like this. And this movie also show the horizontal slab of the, this VG components. So <coughs> for the case of M equals zero, it makes a ring-like pattern like this. And for the non azimuthal mode M, it uh, makes a spiral pattern look like this. And the uh, number of spiral arms depends on the magnitude of M, and the uh, rotating direction is depend depends on the sign of the sign of the M. Okay, and then uh, to make the observational uh, observation uh, observation of the spiral wave pattern, I summing up the m equals zero and one mode to, uh, for the case of uh, one arm spiral wave pattern, and the right figure show the <coughs> Uh, observa observation and uh, modeling. So you can uh, compare these two and the temporal evolution is quite similar. Also, I can uh, uh, summing up the m equals zero and two mode to describe the observational 
uh, two arms parallel pattern, and the uh, upper panel showed the uh, uh, observation, and the uh, lower panel showed the uh, uh, modeling. So it's, uh, the time temporal evolution is quite similar in this case, too. So <coughs> my model is uh, successfully working, and that uh, pattern is looking like uh, our uh, old version of a uh, national flag, this and this. So these are the summary and discussion. The, uh, in this study, I, can, uh, I successfully suggest that the spiral pattern uh, can be generated in an uh, untwisted and non-rotating flux tube, and the uh, one on the spiral pattern is generated by an M equals zero sausage and an M equals one kink mouse. And uh, for the case of a spiral wave pattern with a two arm, it can be, it is maybe formed by the, by an M equals zero sushi mode and an M equals two protein mouse. And this is the discussion. Uh, I just uh, emphasize the third one. Uh, the inward motion of the spiral pattern may be uh, are formed by the uh, uh, combination of the M equal zero and non zero mode like this. And this is the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sure you will have some questions. It all comes down to the fact that you have a complex notation for the exponential i and so forth. Now, you can go from the complex notation to a, a real notation in different ways. You can have standing, propagating in phi, propagating in z. So this is just one special case of that. But how do you excite the m equals zero mode? That I don't understand. You excite from below the photosphere? Uh. Uh, in this uh, modeling, the, all of the uh, m equal zero or uh, one or two mode are come from the below the photosphere, uh, uh, and uh, uh, I is that the your question? You just assume that they are there. How do you excite them? Uh, how? Uh, yeah. uh, I think, uh, in my guess, in my opinion, uh, I think it may be related to the uh, downflow magnetic convection, like the uh, umbrella dot in the sunspot. So, uh, if the umbrella dot uh, uh, falling down and it uh, collide at the dense region in the Below the photosphere, then it can it maybe generate the wave uh, and the uh, the mode azimuthal mode is depends on the uh, source, but I don't know how that uh, wave energy is concentrated on the m equal zero or one. Uh, that's my opinion. <coughs> Yeah, so my question is just related to what uh, Marcel just asked. In a real situation, you will have these umbral, several umbral dots, and all of them happen simultaneously. You will have mm -hmm. several sources going off below the sunspot, right? Right. Uh, will that still produce the same pattern if you have uh, waves emanating from two sources simultaneously, if they come up? Uh, if uh, there are two sources coming together, then I uh, that cannot make a spiral pattern because of the combination of these two wave fronts uh, is mixed. So I think right. it's a complex case. But right, but, but in reality, you expect. Uh, that. That, that's, uh, that's possible, but uh, that is the, my uh, uh, interesting target. Uh. 
Yeah, the example actually which you compared is a pore. It's not a full-fledged sunspot. So yeah. uh, have you tried to look at the sunspots with the penumbral structures and so on? Then things will be much more complicated. And yeah. in those kind of uh, structure also, these kind of uh, you know uh, rotations are you are interpreting only in terms mm -hmm. of uh, sausage modes and kink mm -hmm. modes. But uh, these kind of patterns are seen very mm -hmm. regularly in many, many sunspots. Mm -hmm. So there, uh, do you think your, uh, your model will uh, be still applicable? Uh, uh, could you explain? Again? Yeah, so what I'm trying to say is that the model which you compared with the observations, that, if I recall correctly, it is for a pore. Mm -hmm. Pore is a much simpler magnetic structure uh, yeah. as compared to a, a sunspot. And in fact, the questions which are raised also, mm -hmm. that when you have many, uh, you know, uh, small little umbral dots and also penumbra, mm -hmm. then things are much more complicated. Mm, right. So there also, these kind of uh, patterns of rotations are regularly seen. So mm. do you think that your current model will be able to explain those, uh, you know, situations as well? Uh, yeah, I think so. I think the, this model can also apply to the uh, sunspot data four, and also it can. Uh, but if we, uh, I apply this model to the sunspot, then the, it quite not uh, actually not. Uh, uh, how can I say? Uh, successfully working, but some portion is. Uh, can be successfully described. So that's my opinion. Okay, uh, with that, uh, thanks, uh, Chu Yong again. Okay. So uh, we have one more talk before lunch. He Su Yang will talk about vortex formation and its associated surges in a sunspot light bridge. Yeah, uh, today I want to uh, present about the, with this title. Actually, this work was done with the, the guys, the Harushima, Dr. Harushima Haruhisa Ijima uh, from Japan. Actually, we, we met in the 2015 in Seoul, APSPM meeting. And at the time, we just went to the karaoke. We didn't think about the science stuff. And 2017, we met again in the Japan APSPM meeting. And after then, we, we just work for these subjects together. So actually, there's many, many colleagues uh, working together. But I, I want to emphasize him in here. So my, my presentation is about the vortex formation and its associated surges in uh, Sunspot Right Bridge. So here's uh, some introduction about the surge. The H hyper surge is a jet of the cool chromospheric plasma reaching 10 to 100 megameters. The triggering mechanism of the surge is commonly think of a, think as a magnetic connection and sometimes MHD shock waves. Actually, when, when uh, to the, today's morning, the Shimujo san uh, presented about the evaporation flow. Actually, when I read his paper, his paper also mentioned about the cool plasma ejections with that evaporation flows. The evaporation flow can the accel accelerate the plasma, and it can push up the plasma, and the plasma can make the, sh uh, the, in the, the evaporation flow can make the shocks to accelerate the plasmas, cool plasmas. And most uh, vivid or most prominent uh, uh, features in the surge is the rotating motions. So we can, uh, it was a rotating motion of the surge is explained with the redist redistribution of the stored twist. Uh, actually, the twisted field line and the pre existing field line reconnection, then we can see, we can think uh, that the 
the twisty the field lines at the end. Then twisty the twisty field line can accelerate the plasma. Or uh, some people just mentioned actually this idea is commonly explained for the spicule. The photospheric turbulence can raise the field lines. And here actually when I think about the literature, I, I couldn't find the, the good subject, good papers, but uh, maybe KHI, Kelvin Helmholtz instability, also can raise the field lines. So, so this is our observation. We observe the surge to uh, check out the, like this uh, the previous introduction stuff to study that. Actually, we observe the light ridge, the Right which is a bright rain which divides the sun's part and brine into multiple parts. So it's right which is, the, is thought to be as a hotter than and geometrically higher than the M M ambient umbra. And magnetic field line, uh, commonly people think is has a cosmic shape, like these way, this, uh, like these figures, and. Recently, the many people just uh, reported that the uh, omega-shaped uh, the flux emergence occurs in at the right bridge on the right bridge, and when you think of the flux emergence, that the, that may makes the strong shear flow. So I think we can expect the uh, I can say the Kelvin Helmholtz instability around the right bridge. So here is the uh, my. The, Summarized movie actually. Our observation was done using the 1.6 meter Big Bear Solar Telescope. When you see the right bridge, there is many flows, and around the flow, uh, around the right bridge, you can see the vortex is forming in everywhere, like this and here. So commonly the flow was uh, west uh, west direction. So I think the west direction uh, flow makes the this vortex. And when you see in the H upper line, it shows uh, like these surge ejections. It's one to one correspondence. It has a one to one correspondence with the vortex and the surge. So, and it sometimes has some internal structure. And there's another surge also shows like a internal, has a internal structures. The, the surge is everywhere actually. The vortex is everywhere and also the Surge is also everywhere. So, sorry. I, yeah. So, I we just measured the velocity uh, over the right ridge. So the average speed is two kilometers per second, and sometimes it increased to up to five kilometers per second. And when there is a fast flow, uh, when the fast flow of uh, occur, uh, approaches to the edge of the light bridge, then the vortex was formed. So I just uh, uh, enlarged the photospheric image of the vortex. When you see here, the flow is approaching, vortex was formed. And the size is about 0.3 arc second in this case. And after forming the vortex, it was disappeared. And here is another vortex. When you see in detail, there's a something is approaching, makes a vortex. The size is about 0.5 arc second. And this case, when you see in detail, there's a internal structures. We just mentioned, uh, we just uh, named it as a secondary vortex, like this way. Uh, the size is 1.1 and 0.2 arc second. So this is uh, marginal resolved using the just. Uh, at the time, it was the biggest uh, telescope. <laughs> it was marginally resolved. And when you think about the, like the secondary vortex stuff, it, it's uh, quite well matched with the multi threading. It can be explained the multi threading nature of the surge, like the stuff. So, as I mentioned, every vortex has a one to one correspondence with the, with the surges. So, here is the, the porospheric, porospheric image, and here is the h alpha blue wing, red wing, and the differential image of the h alpha images. When you see in detail, it's too small, so I enlarged some parts. When you see in detail, vortex was here and around here. So vortex in the, in the wing image, you can see the brightings and the 
bottom of the vortex and right above the right bridge, uh, uh, right above the vortex, and uh, <coughs> there is a surge, and bluing and the red wing shows another surge structures. So when you compare the in the differential image, it shows a blue and the red the, is aligned. So it looks like a rotational motions. We can expect it. And in this case, it shows the uh, surge has a like this internal structures, two surge structures, dark structures. So when we exp when we speculate, when when we see that, we can speculate that the surge has a hollow cylindrical structures. So I just made the made the space time plot. This is the, the time and the slit along the surge, and you can see and this uh, enlarged version of this this parts. So this the uh, vortex ext extension, and when you see in the H alpha image, this the bluing and the red wing of the H alpha line, the brightening was extended along the right free, uh, the vortex. And this is another event. When you see in detail, uh, here is a blue wing. Surge was appeared, and it moves to the red wing. It means just a moving upward and downward motion of the surge. And when you see in detail uh, near the four sphere, or the near the vortex, you can see some brightenings. Yeah, some brightenings uh, with some uh, quasi-periodic ejections, right this way. So the time cadence of this brightening is 79 seconds in this, in this case. Yeah, in this case is another surge, another surge event. Also shows a similar structures. The brightening has a 110 second. When we makes the when when we check the image in for that brightening, we can see like these bright bright blobs is moving aboard sequentially. So also, I, I do not mention about I don't want to mention about the whole details of the magnetic field data, but the velocity, the the vortex side shows a strong redshift, right this way, in the four sphere. So here, uh, I just summarize the whole our observational result, like this way. There's transverse motion along the light bridge, and the vortex was formed, and sometimes it has a the secondary vortex. And surge was ejected. We also observed the bright blobs. So to explain these whole new findings uh, uh, for the vortex, we just saw that the Kelvin Helmholtz instability can triggers the can makes the can makes the vortex vortex structures and also best of effect when the here is also downflowing regions. So when the convective downflowing is strong, then the magnetic because the momentum conservation. Uh, maybe we can expect the right the strong let's say vortex structures. The best of effect can strengthen the vortex structures. And for the surge, we can think about we can think it as a reconnections because the bright blob was ejected. We can think is it as a, the reconnection signature. Yeah, actually it's classical explanation and also the because uh, we cannot. Uh, it's quite periodic, so we can explain it. The MHD shock waves generated by the the bottom, the MHD wave produced by produced by the vortex formations. So that's all. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Hezu. Uh, questions. Yeah, uh, congratulations for <laughs> discovering such a very nice vortex motion. I think I'm very much impressed. And uh, uh, as for the uh, possible origin of the surges, well, this is, of course, a very important point yeah. to be studied. Uh, you said that there is a signature of a reconnection. Uh, yeah. what, how, how do you think uh, uh, reconnection? How such a uh, uh, Twisted the field lines reconnect with other field lines. So, yeah, we just uh, we have just uh, the drawing models. So I didn't draw in detail. Sorry. Yeah, actually, this was a uh, uh, drawing what I expected. <laughs> just uh, the 
actually because the the emerging flux was approaching here, so uh, yeah, this one is better. So emerging this blue line is the the maybe the field lines, uh, the emerging flux. Then the emerging field line can follow the vortex. Actually, this is not the the typical KHI models, but the field line can follow the vortex. Then reconnection occurs with the the pre-existing field field lines in the umbra. Then we can make like these reconnections and uh, also sli slingshot effect can accelerate the uh, plasmas. Actually, it's hard to make the I hard to expect the rotating motion of the plasmas, so surge plasmas. But uh, you you already observed the rota rotation rotating motion of the surge. Yeah, in previous slide uh -huh. there was a surge and. It shows uh, blue wing and red wing shows uh, different colors. Sometimes I better show one. Yeah, here when we think about the surge direct axis here, then blue uh, red is located here, but the blue was located here. So yeah, we just have an image, so okay. it's not vivid. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. there is yeah, too the many speculations. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yes. for okay, that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the question I have. You, you rely on the kelvin helmholtz instability, mm -hmm. but the magnetic field is along the flow? Yeah, actually there is a, some, some along the, the magnetic field along the flow. Yeah, that's so also you, the concept. How do you overcome then the stabilizing effect of the magnetic field? Yeah, actually magnetic density in there is uh, quite strong. Uh, um, I don't know. Plasma density is quite strong in the force sphere. So, and when you think of the emerging flux, it'll be easily the can be vertical, yeah. So the, the horizontal field line, horizontal field lines can be moved upward to the chromosphere and the, for the corona, and the, only the vertical components of the field line can remain in the force sphere. That's that was my. Uh, Idea. Did you do any calculations about the stability analysis? Actually, it's not possible to <laughs> calculate in this case because it's quite a complex case uh, because uh, we also con so we consider about the best of effect also okay. uh, because of that. Yeah, very nice observation. But I have one note thing which I'm noting is uh, the surge material is actually much cooler. Yeah. As compared to the the what uh, says. So how do you explain uh, if, if the surge material is out of uh, magnetic reconnection, don't you expect those material to be also very hot? Here it is uh, quite contrary. All the surges which I uh, observe is uh, in absorption actually and they're very, very cool as it appears from the images. Of course you have to do okay. a proper spectroscopy probably, uh -huh. but uh, that's my impression. Yes. Uh yeah, surge material is excellent. So, so I suggest another idea. So, image wave, shock, some, some waves can accelerate that. So, actually, yeah, reconnection energy generates the surge, can generate the surge, but I cannot explain. So, I just mentioned there's a slingshot effect. In the case, just a reconnection, reconnected field line can accelerate the cool plasmas. Uh, just a response to the bunker. I mean, you can have this surge-like material just as a slingshot with the cooler plasma. Yeah. The hot material will only come when you start the evaporation. Yeah. So that will be... That's possible. Yeah. Okay. But it's, it's a very important note that it is very cool. Most of the yeah. The, there are simulations by Fernando Moreno inserters and collaborators of uh, jets in uh, of flux emergence in coronal hole regions, and there are, there's a cool surge at the edge that's from uh -huh. the magnetic field pressing against the, the yeah. cool material. Okay. Um, other questions? Uh, anyway, um, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. I, I want to congratulate all the speakers in this previous session who all, all of them uh, finished on time. And, <laughs> and I also en encourage students to ask questions. I think we should system where um, uh, senior, senior researchers have to pay to ask questions and, and the students get paid to ask questions. We can introduce this in the next session. Uh, okay, no, so before we break for lunch, um, 
This evening, uh, our director invites you all for the conference dinner at his uh, house in his garden. So at, uh, after the uh, cultural program we have from 6.30 to 8 and 8 to 10.30. Uh, for tomorrow, uh, I mean, we have been uh, trying to do uh, pick you up, drop you, provide lunches and dinners. And uh, I heard from some people, oh, you are keeping us captive. We, we want to also go and look around the city. So uh, what we've done is we've left a sheet of paper uh, on the desk outside. Uh, if you would like to have your dinner tomorrow at Ayuka, please put down your name so that we can plan it for tomorrow dinner. So the, both the options are available. Um, of course, I mean, you have come from far away, so you should be enjoying the city. And you still have Friday also to do that. You have to sign in that you would have dinner. OK, so that uh, we know the number and the food doesn't get wasted. Um, so let's break for lunch. And I would like uh, the, the SOC uh, SOC members and uh, uh, included members like Mike and Sibata-san to, to be here. Uh, and I will take you all uh, for our business meeting uh, to uh, and the smaller room.